This is a Killer Cab production. Church and make some noise, black family. How's everybody doing? One love, one love, one love. It's good to be back. All right. Excuse me, one second. I'm sorry, Doc. Don't ever do that again. When y'all give me the mic, it's my time. I know, I got you. No, you're right, Baba. I got you. I know. Right. I got it. I got it. It is a custom in African tradition to ask elders for permission to speak. Do I have permission to speak? Yes, to our ancestors whose shoulders we stand on, to our elders whose shadows we walk in, I greet you, my dear brothers and sisters, in the language of one of the greatest civilizations on this planet that gave the world the basic disciplines of knowledge, of science, math, architecture, music, writing, law, your religion, you name it, we did it. In fact, you can go to YouTube and pull up a documentary called Great Pyramids K 2019. It'll tell you who built the pyramids and how they were built. Please do that. Although it's three and a half hours long. I greet you, my dear brothers and sisters, in the language of the greatest civilization, the word of peace. I greet you all. Hotel. Let me greet you in other languages of our people. Jambo. Alafia. Abaragani. Assalamualaikum. Yo, make it. What's up? What's happening? Let's do this. I'm going to use water because water has no enemies. Everything on the planet that lives it needs water. From a tiny microscopic organism to a tall redwood tree, it needs water. We're going to pour water into the earth to invoke the spirits of our ancestors, and we say the word, Ashe. Say, Ashe. Which simply means, so be it. So we pour this libation to God for all the names he may call God. Overdumare, Allah, Elohim. We pour this libation to God for all that God has done and for all that God will do. Which Ashe. We pour this libation to Mother Africa, birthplace of all humanity. Everyone who has lived, everyone who's living, we all have a common ancestral root in Africa. You say, Ashe? We pour this libation to classical civilization of Africa. I mentioned Kemet. Kemet was the height, the apex, the zenith, the pinnacle of African high cultures. But there are others as well. There was Chimeri, there was Pont, there was Nubia. So we pour this libation to classical civilization of Africa. We say, Ashe? Ashe. We pour this libation to contemporary civilization of Africa of Ghana, Mali, Zangai, Benin, Great Zimbabwe, all the civilizations that were flourishing and growing while Europe was in a medieval or dark age. The University of Timbuktu in Sakare, a fine example of a great educational institution. So we pour this libation. We say, Ashe? Ashe. We pour this libation to the Ma'afa, the Infakani, the Holocaust of our captivity, our enslavement, uprooted out of Africa. We lay a carpet along the Atlantic Ocean. So we pour this libation to their memory. We don't know their names, but because of them and their suffering sacrifice, we are here. We always want to honor them. So we pour this libation to the brothers and sisters who suffered the Ma'afa. We say, Ashe? We pour this libation to brothers and sisters who fought against enslavement. If you ever heard me do a libation, you will know we were not slaves. Let me repeat, we were not slaves, we were captives. A slave is somebody or something that submits its will to a master. We never submitted. We fought on the continent, we fought on those ships, we fought in the middle passage, we continue to fight today. We always resisted. In fact, I maintain that some of us are more slaves today than we were in our original captivity because we are slaves to drugs, to vice, to corruption. So we always, we were not slaves, we were captives. So we poured us libation to Nat Turner, Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Harriet Tugman, and all those brothers and sisters that fought for freedom. Sashay? Sashay. We poured us libation to the brothers and sisters of my generation of the 60s. Those brothers and sisters who talked about one love and brotherhood and sisterhood understood it and meant it. So we poured us libation to the brothers and sisters of the 60s. We say, Ashe? We poured us libation to those unborn, 
those young brothers and sisters who will once again lead us back on the stage of human history as free and proud and productive people. We say, Ashe? We pour this libation to brothers and sisters who have gone on to be with their ancestors. My dear friend and brother, Dr. Renoka Rashidi, you heard him being mentioned, or the other brother. He died this couple weeks ago. He was born. In fact, his birthday is tomorrow. His birthday is tomorrow. And uh, this is Black August. That's why it's great that the Prince of Pan-Africanism, my good friend, yeah, is here with us. This is Black August. Give us a hand. That's right. Dr. Umar Johnson. So, but we pour this libation. I want you to say the names of those who have gone on. They could be instrumental in your life. They could be Uncle June Bug, Aunt Willie, Aunt Judah May, whoever. But who are inspirational to you. If you want to say famous people, so forth. Because by saying their name, you keep their, you keep their memory and their spirit alive. Brothers and sisters, at this time, say the names. Say it out loud. Say the names. Say the names. Say the names. Say the names. Say Ashe. Ashe. We pour this libation to brotherhood and sisterhood. We need each other. We need we need each other to produce families, to produce compliments, to produce strong children who are warriors, who have their right mind, who are independent, self-determining, liberated, and fight to be sovereign. So we pour this libation to us as a future of our people. Brothers and sisters, let us all say, Ashe, 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 oh, Ashe, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Baba. Put your hands together for Baba Oshie here. This is the first elder to bring me to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And speaking of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, I'll be making my sixth visit to Milwaukee on my birthday this coming Saturday, which is the 190th anniversary of the commencement of the Nat Turner War. It is also the 230th anniversary of the commencement of the Haitian Revolutionary War. And it is the 50th anniversary of Soledad brother George Jackson's war against mass incarceration when he was assassinated on August the 21st of 1971. So I'll be in Milwaukee on Saturday at the Generation of Excellence Community Center. And it'll be the first time that I am not in Nat Turner Lane, Virginia on August the 21st, where I've been every year for the past 10 years celebrating the greatest revolutionary to ever walk on American soil, the prophet Nat Turner. But before we get to Milwaukee Saturday night, I want to invite all of you to join us in Kenosha, Wisconsin, where last year, on August the 23rd of 2020, our brother Jacob Blake was shot and paralyzed by the police in Kenosha. And so his father, Jacob Blake Sr., invited me to stand in solidarity with him and his family and the entire black Kenosha community on Saturday. There will be a march and rally beginning at 12 noon in Civic Center Park in Milwaukee, excuse me, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which is probably about a good hour, maybe an hour and a half from Chicago, Illinois. So with that being said, I wanna go ahead and speak to the purpose of why we're here today, to honor the legacy, the memory, and the works of the greatest Pan-Africanist of all time, the greatest black organizer of all time, and the greatest black leader of the 20th century. You cannot talk about black leadership. You cannot talk about black nationalism. You cannot talk about Pan-Africanism or revolutionary Pan-African nationalism without talking about the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. You can't talk about the Moors. You can't talk about the Nation of Islam. You can't talk about the Black Panther Party, the Nawapians, the Hebrews, the Rastas, or anyone else without talking about the man whose cup from which they all drank from. And that's the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. Two days ago, I began my Garvey birthday weekend tour on the 101st anniversary of the red, black, and green flag. 
which was August 13, 1920, the occasion of which was the first international convention of the African peoples of the world, held in Madison Square Garden, New York City. More than 25,000 Africans packed inside, almost another 50,000 packed outside. There's been three Madison Square Gardens built since then, but what Garvey did in August of 1920, and again in August of 1921, has never been done before, and hasn't been done since. He assembled the greatest convention of African dignitaries in modern history. At the 1920 convention, when a red, black, and green flag was selected, there was representation of African people from every single place on the planet Earth. That red, black, and green flag is unlike the flag of any other organization in our community. It is unlike the flag of any other nation in our community. Because unlike every other flag that flies, they represent religions, they represent organizations, they represent nations, but it is the red, black, and green flag that represents all members of the African race. And it is the red, black, and green flag that was chosen by representatives of the African race. And so with the red, black, and green being 101 years old and now two days as of today, we celebrate the father of that red, black, and green flag. Marcus Messiah Garvey, who turns 134 years old in spirit on Tuesday. And on his Earth Day in Tuesday, we will be in the city that made Marcus Garvey famous. And that is Harlem, New York City, where I will keynote, along with Malik Zulu Shabazz of the New Black Panther Party and Dr. J Leonard Jeffries, our senior most African Senate scholar, the three of us, with myself as the keynote, will pay homage to the greatest of black leaders of the 20th century. Marcus Garvey is often misunderstood for many reasons. One of the biggest reasons why Garvey is so misunderstood is because he operated from a perspective of independent nationhood. Marcus Garvey did not operate from a religious narrative, nor did he operate from an integrationist narrative. The Marcus Garvey Movement, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League was not a government or a church. It was, excuse me, it was not an organization or a church. It was a government in exile. The UNIA was built as a government by Mr. Garvey, waiting for that opportunity of when we could repossess ourselves of Africa and of all African territories around the world. It was a government. When you talk about Garveyism, you have to talk about the heart of Garveyism, which is repatriation. To go back to Africa and to build it up. Some people say, why well, waste your time with that? After Garvey died in 1940, June 10th, and after Garvey was deported from America in 1927, almost every organization that came after Garvey took us away from our African identity, took us away from our African consciousness, took us away from our African loyalty and substituted it with a religion or a false identity. But brothers and sisters, I'm here to say that Garveyism is still alive and well. The heart and soul of revolutionary pan-African nationalism beats as hard today as it did in Garvey's day. Africa must be for the Africans. Garvey said if Europe is for the European and China for the Chinese, Africa must be for the African. And brothers and sisters, why do we never give up our right, our birthright to be an African? It's because only a fool would concede his control to the most minerally, minerally rich land on the face of the earth. Africa has more than 50% of the essential minerals of the planet. For those of you who are engineers and scientists, you know that there are three to five metals that are absolutely necessary for the creation of an atomic weapon, and it can only be found in Africa. For those of you with a cell phone or a laptop, you know that inside that device is a mineral known as 
coltan and 50 percent or more of the world's coltan is made in africa the world cannot exist without africa so why is it that the american negro thinks he can you will always be second place until you recognize that respect is only given to people who identify and stand in solidarity with the international homeland up the street in atlanta a few months ago there was a tragedy the Atlanta Massage Parlor murders, where a European walked in and murdered about seven, eight, nine Asian women. Immediately following that tragedy, the newly elected president, Joe Biden, newly elected Vice President Kamala Harris, took a flight down to Atlanta and had a personal meeting with the Asian community of Georgia. Now, when Trayvon Martin was murdered, the black community didn't get a personal meeting with the president. When Breonna Taylor was murdered, the black community didn't get a personal meeting with the president. When Philando Castile and Sandra Bland and Tommy Rice and Eric Garner, and we could go on and on, when they were murdered, we didn't get a personal visit from the president. Why did the Chinese get one? Because the Chinese are represented by a nation known as China. And if America allows police or anybody else to get away with killing Chinese, there will be consequences and reproduction excuse me, re repercussions from the nation of China. There's Chinese gangs in America. Why don't the police kill off the Chinese gangs like they do black gang members? There's still Jewish gangs in this country. There's still Irish gangs in this country. Arabs have gangs. Why don't they get killed at the same rate we get killed? Because they are represented by nations. America doesn't want to suffer the consequences of disrespecting the ethnic national of another nation. But black people are killed, incarcerated, miseducated, and the white man doesn't think twice about what he does to you. Why is that? Because there's not a country on the planet Earth that's going to pick up the phone and take your defense. Who's, who's going to call for black America? Is the president of Ghana going to pick up the phone? Is the president of Nigeria going to pick up the phone? Is the president of Jamaica going to pick up the phone? Is the president of Ethiopia going to pick up the phone? No, and why not? Because we have stopped identifying with Africa, and we have stopped building diplomatic relationships with our ancestral homeland. The Honorable Marcus Garvey said, a strong man is strong everywhere. A strong man is strong everywhere. I can testify to that. Having traveled to every continent in the world except Australia, having spoken to every major black population on this planet, I can tell you that everywhere I go, the black man and woman is on the bottom. You're on the bottom in America. You're on the bottom in the Caribbean. You're on the bottom in Central America. You're on the bottom in Europe. You're on the bottom in Asia. You're even on the bottom in Africa. But I never see the Chinese on the bottom nowhere I go. I never see the European Jew on the bottom nowhere I go. I never see the Arab on the bottom, nowhere I go, only the Negro. Only the black man and woman of the greatest continent in history, only us are always on the bottom. And you know why? We have not made up our minds to get up off that bottom. Marcus Garvey said, you are where you are not because your skin is black, but because you have chosen not to organize yourself. The Honorable Marcus Garvey said the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. The white man is the most organized. The Chinese is now surpassing the white man in organization. And the Chinese are now the world superpower, whether the white man administers it or not. The Chinese are number one. The white man is number two. The Arab is plotting and planning to become number three. And the black man is in church praying and at the mosque praying. You ain't building anything. You're not doing anything. And that's why we are where we are. And I don't have a problem with you being in the church. Garvey was a Christian. I don't have a problem with you being in the masjid. Malcolm X, child of the Garvey movement, was a Muslim. But what are you doing besides waiting on God to change your problems? If you think God is going to solve your problems, your problems will never get solved. And why is that? Because God gave you everything you need to solve your own problems. Your issue is you're too lazy and too scared of white folks to make a difference. Look at what goes on in these schools right here in Macon, Georgia. Look at all the black boys in special ed. Look at all these alien ideologies being pumped into our babies' brains. Look at all the learning disabilities. Look at all the ADHD, the conduct disorders. Look at all the misdiagnosed autism and intellectually disab disabilities and emotional disturbances. Why is that?
black people spend two billion dollars on Air Jordans every year. We ain't got no schools. Four billion dollars on liquor every year. You ain't got no schools. Eight hundred million dollars on chicken, turkey, beef, and pork, but you ain't got no schools. Over three billion dollars on video games, but you ain't got no school. We can talk about racism. But Marcus Garvey said sooner or later you got to look in the mirror and ask yourself why you are accepting second class citizenship on the planet earth. Nobody gave the white man control of this planet. He took it and you let him take it. So you are just as responsible for being on the bottom as he is being on the top. And the eternal sin of African people continues to be perpetuated. And that is the colorblind consciousness of the black man and woman of the planet earth. You still refuse to see color. Everybody else can tell you black, but you can't tell they not. One of our biggest issues as a people is we feel uncomfortable dealing with the question of race. We say race don't exist. Who told you that lie? If race don't exist, why can they dig up a skeleton and look at a skeleton and tell you whether that skeleton is, was an African or a European? If there's no such thing as race, why they can look at a heart and tell you if this is the heart of an African or the heart of a European? If there's no such thing as race, why they can look at the brain, the kidney, the liver of a human being and tell you exactly where they come from? Race is real, but you don't want to admit it because you think it makes you inferior to talk about race. Marcus Garvey said two words, race first. What did Mr. Garvey mean when he said race first? He meant that in all things political, all things economic, all things social, all things philosophical, all things cultural and ideological, put African people first. As Pan-Africanists, as Garveyites, being African is the most important thing in my life. Being African is more important than your Bible. It's more important than your Quran. It's more important than your Torah. It's more important than your fraternity. It's more important than your sorority. It's more important than your Masonic Lodge. African nationalism is first. Why? Why is being African more important than everything else? Because it's the only thing you belong to that God chose. God made you an African. You made yourself a Christian. You can quit the church tomorrow. God made you an African. You made yourself a Muslim. You can quit the mosque tomorrow. God made you an African. You made yourself a Q and a Sigma. You made yourself a Delta and an AKA. It ain't nothing wrong with that. But it does not come before your Africanity. Chinese don't all get along. They don't get along with the Vietnamese. They don't get along with the North Koreans. The Koreans don't like the Cambodians. The Cambodians don't like the Southeast Asians. They got all types of issues amongst them as a race. But when it comes time to look at what's in the best interest of all Asian people, guess what? There's a time out to the petty differences and they all take care of the racial business of being Asian. The white men don't always get along. The Irish think they better than the Jews. The Jews think they better than the Anglo-Saxons. The Anglo-Saxons think they better than the Italians. But guess what? When it comes time to look out for the best interests of white supremacy, all petty internal differences are brought to a halt until the white man handles his international business. He goes back to fighting only after he makes sure he took care to protect white supremacy. Latinos don't all get along. Mexicans don't necessarily like the Ricans. Puerto Ricans don't like the Cubans. Cubans got issues with the Dominicans. But guess what? When it comes to the Latino agenda, they can put all the petty differences to the side and work together. The Arabs don't always get along. Those of Iran don't necessarily like those of Iraq. Those of Iraq don't necessarily like those of Kuwait. The Kuwaitis don't necessarily like the Lebanese and so forth and so on. But when it comes to the best interests of the Arab League, they can put it all to the side. There's only one race of people on this planet. There's only one group who will fight, even if it means risking everything for the future of their children, and that's the African. We will fight and destroy the entire movement in order to satisfy our ego. That's why you can't have a Negro without an ego. And if you take the letters E-G-O out the word Negro, it no longer exists. The ego of the Negro is the greatest risk to the liberation of African people. 
It is the black man's ego that led to Malcolm X's murder. It was the black man's ego that led to Patrice Lumumba's murder. It was the black man's ego that helped set up Dr. King. It was the black man's ego that destroyed Amical Cabral and Guinea Bassaw. Look at all of our great movements, even Garvey. The Negroes of America, the black leadership clique, went to the United States government and begged the president to get rid of Marcus Garvey. W.E.B. Du Bois got his jealous self on a boat and went to Liberia at the request of the U.S. State Department and begged the president of Liberia, do not let Marcus Garvey set up a nation here. And why was W.E.B. Du Bois so jealous of Garvey? Because W.E.B. Du Bois thought that he had a doctorate from Harvard it meant he should be the leader. See, we got to look real deep and real hard and real long at this talented 10th idea that he gave us in Souls of Black Folk. Because I personally believe that the talented 10th idea of W.E.B. Du Bois is a very big reason why we as African people haven't made more progress since Dr. King. It's why we haven't made more progress since the independence of Ghana in 1957. This belief that Africans have to be led by college educated Negroes. Y'all have that belief in Georgia. We have it in Philadelphia. They have it in Nigeria. It's in Ethiopia. It's in Jamaica. It's in Trinidad. The white man has convinced the black man that the only way your problems can be solved is if you let somebody who we trained lead you into freedom. And so W.E.B. Du Bois felt that the college-educated Negro was the best one fit for leadership. I disagree. I totally disagree. The reason why we keep running in quicksand, black America, is because of college-educated Negroes. So you say, well, Dr. Umar, you got six of them degrees, don't you? I do. But I happen to be an exception to the rule because I knew what my life would be dedicated to before I got those degrees. But we got to understand something. A college-educated Negro got too much to lose to sacrifice for you. A college-educated Negro is getting too paid too well to lead you. They got too much student loan debt to pay off to lead you. They have relationships with white people that they must protect in order to lead you. The college-educated Negro will not be the savior of black folks. And the minute we wake up and recognize that, we'll be better off for it. I'd rather be led by a brother fresh out of prison. A brother fresh out of prison ain't afraid to go to prison because he been there. He ain't afraid to be beat by the police. He been there. He ain't afraid to be shot at. He been there. He not afraid of conflict. He been there. You want to bring me a Negro with a Mercedes in a three-piece suit. What the hell he going to do for liberation? We have to rethink everything, brothers and sisters. The reason W.E.B. Du Bois was so jealous of Garvey is because he felt that after Booker T died, the boy said, I'm the next HNIC. I had to wait for Douglas to join the ancestors. I had to wait for Booker T to join the ancestors. And of course, he didn't like Booker T who influenced Marcus Garvey to found the greatest organization in modern history. Because Booker T told W.E.B. Du Bois, you want Negroes to live next to white folks, and you want Negroes to have a right to vote. What difference does it make if you can cast the vote, if you can't even pay the bills in your house? The wisdom of Booker T, we see it today. Chinese folks are all in the black ghetto. Do they care who becomes president? Do they care who becomes governor? Do they care who the next mayor is? Hell no, because if you want to buy something, you're going to come buy it from them. What did Father Rothschild say? Father Rothschild, who helped create the international banking cartel of the world, said, give me control of a people's money. Give me control of a people's money, and I care not who makes the law. Black folks weren't about who gonna get elected. Chinese weren't about that dollar in the black community. Black folks weren't about who wanna be elected. Koreans is worried about that dollar in the black community. Black folks is worried about who will be the next president, governor, mayor, but the Arabs, the East Indians, the Latinos, and everybody else is worried about getting that black dollar. Because you got it backwards. Politics don't control money. Money controls politics. Why you think every senator is a millionaire? 
Why has every president been a millionaire? Why have most governors been a millionaire? You don't get into politics to get money. You get into politics to protect the money you already got. You keep on electing black people to elected office who are nothing but plantation slaves of the Democratic Party. And you wonder why you don't get nothing in Georgia. Much respect to Stacey Abrams. She delivered Georgia to Joe Biden on the silver platter. He didn't even give her a presidential appointment. First day in office, he signs a historic LGBT bill. Black folks got him in, but he ran right past you and signed an LGBT bill. After the Asian crisis, he signed an anti-Asian hate bill. But when I asked you what did Obama do for black people, you told me Obama can't do nothing for black people. He has to do it for Americans. Well, Joe Biden just signed an anti-hate bill just for Asians. That's exactly why I don't vote for black politicians unless they're independent. If you're not an independent candidate, you can't get my vote. Why is that, brothers and sisters? Because if you're not an independent candidate, you don't have an independent mindset, you don't have an independent plan, an independent program, or no independent courage. The hell I want to vote for another black Democrat for? We've been voting for them since our great-grandparents was around. And every time you vote, what they say, wait till next election. Well, guess what, brothers and sisters? Most of you will live through 21 presidential administrations before you go to the ancestors. Every president gets four years. Four times 21 take you to about 84 or more. 21 presidential administrations, which one has done something for you yet? Which one? Clinton do anything? I said he was black because he smoked weed and played the sax. Damn coons, and look what he did. Filled up the prisons more than any Republican president you can name in history. Bill Clinton played that saxophone and turned right around and gave you three strikes and you out. He smoked that weed and turned right around and gave you mandatory minimum sentencing. Lyndon Baines Johnson signed the Civil Rights Bill and the Voting Rights Act and turned right around and signed the Police Department Law Enforcement Assistant Act. Do you know what the Law Enforcement Assistance Act was? It was an act to militarize inner city police to prevent another riot like the kind they had in 67 after King died, excuse me, 68 after King died, and 67 after Newark and Detroit. So while you were celebrating the Civil Rights Bill, this damn Democratic president was giving the police military-grade weapons and surveillance equipment to make sure there'd never be another black revolt. And I just heard Negroes in the last presidential election talk about how great Lyndon Baines Johnson was. Your problem is you need a white savior. That's what black America's problem is. We need a white man to believe in because we don't believe in ourselves. That's right. The black church has conditioned you that you must have a white savior. What did Garvey say about the white savior? Garvey said, God is spirit. But if you must give God a human representation, it must look like you. But this church is in Georgia where y'all still got a white Christ on the wall. Some of y'all got a white picture of Jesus in your house right now. Talking about you conscious. You got a green smoothie, a pack of frankincense, a dashiki, and a cracker on the damn wall you praying to. See, there's two Jesuses in the black community. There's Jesus Christ and there's Jesus Cracker. Jesus Christ was a black man born in Ethiopia. Jesus Cracker was born in the manger in Bethlehem. Jesus Christ was blue, black, purple. Jesus Cracker looked like Michael Bolton. Jesus Christ was hung from a tree. Jesus Cracker was hung from a cross. Which one are you praying to? Garvey said, Africanize your religion. It's okay to be about the Bible. We had it first. But he took it and gave it back. The white man took it, remixed it, and gave it back to you. But we had it first. Africanize it. You want to be a Muslim, no problem. Pray your five prayers a day. But Africanize it. One of the greatest things the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey did was he did not put a religion on his organization. He's the only leader after slavery who had the wisdom to not put religion on his movement. They came to Garvey. They said, Garvey, put Islam on it. Garvey said, no. For what? We don't suffer because we Muslims are not Muslims. 
They said, make it a Christian thing, Garvey. You a Christian. He said, why would I do that? Every African is not a Christian, and we don't suffer because we Christian or not Christian. Garvey said, if you want to pray to Jesus, go to church. You want to pray with the Muslims, go to the mosque. But when you come here, we exist for one purpose, the independence of African people. That's it. No Bibles, no Korans. Leave that stuff at home. If there's a religion that has ever saved black folks, let me know what it is. I must be missing something. None of those religions are going to save you because none of those religions have your liberation as a priority. When you go to church on Sunday, the pastor don't want to talk about black liberation. When you go to the Sunni mass chair on Friday for Juma, he don't want to talk about no black liberation. How can you worship God in the system through which you worship God doesn't care about your oppression. Something's wrong with that. How can you claim to be about God's work, but you letting the devil run free? Brothers and sisters, Marcus Garvey was born August 17th, 1887. By the time he's a teenager, he's already the foreman of a printing mill in Kingston as a teen. A dispute erupts between the employees and the company. And Marcus Garvey, being the African revolutionary that he was, sacrificed his job and decided to represent his employees. In Jamaica, Marcus Garvey joins the National Club, led by Sandy Cox, one of his first introductions to Pan-Africanism. And then he meets the Famous Pan-African is from the Bahamas, Robert Love. Robert Love was good friends with my ancestor, Frederick Douglass. And had it not been for Frederick Douglass, Robert Love may have never met Marcus Garvey because Robert Love was such a revolutionary, he was always in trouble with the white power structure, and Frederick Douglass had to save him on a few occasions. Had he not been able to do that, Robert Love would have never made it to Jamaica. We may have never known Garvey. People say, why you name the school Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey? He was an integrationist. He was a nationalist. But what you don't know, if it wasn't for him, this one wouldn't have existed. So Garvey works with Robert Love and Sandy Cox, and he's developing his Pan-Africanism, and he's studying. And he's reading all the great Pan-Africanists who came before him. So he starts traveling throughout the Caribbean. And everywhere Garvey went, he said, the black man is on the bottom. Even in a country predominantly black, everywhere I go, the black man is being kicked about and mistreated. He went to Panama, Panama. He went to Costa Rica. He went all through the Central and South America in the Caribbean islands. And Garvin, Garvey said, wherever I looked, the black man was treated like a second-class citizen. So he asked himself, where's the black man's king and his queen? Where's the black man's government? Where's the black man's army? Where's the black man's navy? He said, I looked and I didn't see it, so I decided to make it. Garvey goes to England to visit his sister. While he's in England, he meets Deuce Muhammad Ali. He starts writing for Deuce Muhammad Ali's paper, The African Time and Orient Review, but I want to clarify something. Deuce Muhammad Ali is not Marcus Garvey's introduction to Pan-Africanism. That is a lie that some of my Muslim brothers like to push. That is an absolute lie. Garvey was a Pan-Africanist before he ever met Deuce Muhammad Ali. And if you really want to get further into that, Marcus Garvey had to kick Deuce Muhammad Ali out the UNIA for teaching anti-African rhetoric. So be careful with your Deuce Muhammad Ali assertions, but we respect Deuce for being the intellect and the scholar that he was. I just want to correct the record for those who say Garvey didn't know Pan-Africanism before he got to England. I suggest you do your research on Robert Love, who was a much greater Pan-Africanist than Deuce Muhammad Ali ever was. So Garvey decides to head on back to Jamaica. While he's on the ship, he reads this book by this great Negro educator, Booker T. Washington, called Up From Slavery. And Garvey's reading up from slavery, and he's being mesmerized by the words of Booker T. And the work and the labor and the hard road Booker T had to build Tuskegee Institute. 
Garvey says, I want to go to America. I want to meet with this man and I want to build this type of school right here in Jamaica. When Garvey sets, when he docks in Jamaica, he meets a beautiful African queen, Queen Mother Amy Ashwood Garvey. Both wives were named Amy. And so in July, they started organizing the UNIA ACL, launched in August of 1914 in Jamaica. They start holding their mass meetings on Sunday at 3 o'clock, a tradition that keeps still even to this day. The UNIA meets Sunday at 3 o'clock. They chose 3 o'clock because they wanted to make sure they was not competing with the church. They wanted to make sure everybody who needed to go get their Jesus on could get it on and still come back and talk about African nationalism. So Garvey decides I got to go to America and meet with Booker T. The Honorable Marcus Garvey shows up in America in 1916. Booker T had just died. He missed them by this much. But he goes to Tuskegee anyway, and he meets with Booker T. Washington, second in control, R. R. Moulton of Tuskegee, who we find out later was a paid U.S. Army undercover agent sent to Tuskegee to spy on Booker T. Washington. Why did the Army send Moulton to Tuskegee to spy on Booker T. Washington? Because everybody knows Booker T. Washington, contrary to what you've been told, was not a house Negro. Booker T. Washington used the Tuskegee Institute as a hideout and a safe haven for African revolutionaries who were on the run from the government and the Ku Klux Klan. If you couldn't find nowhere else to hide out, you could come hide out at the Tuskegee Institute. Does that sound like a sellout to you? Did anybody tell you that Booker T. Washington was using his personal finances to finance lawsuits on behalf of black civil rights, justice, and equality? Does that sound like a sellout to you? And guess what? Before Marcus Garvey came to America, Booker T. Washington in 1912 had already held the International Conference of the Negro. Booker T was already communicating with Africa. How many of you knew that Booker T was supposed to be present at the first Pan-African Conference of 1900 in London held by Henry Sylvester Williams of Trinidad? Booker T and Henry Sylvester Williams were friends. Booker T. Washington was a Pan-Africanist who supported the Pan-Africanist movement. One of the reasons Garvey wanted to meet with Booker T. is because of his International Conference of the Negro. Not just about Tuskegee, but they saw the world through the same eyes of revolutionary Pan-Africanism. So Garvey meets with R.R. R. Moulton. He didn't know he was an agent, but he didn't like him. He said something about him just didn't sit well. He knew he was an agent then. He just couldn't put his finger on it. Garvey heads back to New York. He goes on a 38-state whirlwind tour to raise money for a Tuskegee Institute in Jamaica. When he's done the 38-state tour, which takes almost a year, the Pan-Africanists in New York, they come to Marcus Garvey, they say, are you sure you want to go back to Jamaica? Why not build your movement here? Garvey said, no, I must go back to Jamaica. That's where... The headquarters is, and they said, well, from what we heard, your movement didn't do too well in Jamaica. From what we heard, the bourgeoisie of Jamaica tried to destroy your organization. From what we heard, the Caribbean islands is not quite the place to build an African solidarity movement because the white colonizer has divided our people up into so many different groups that they too busy fighting for skin color privilege and fighting to be black. See, Garveyism survived in America and thrived in a way it couldn't in Jamaica. Why was Garvey so stunningly successful from New York City, but he couldn't do the same thing from Kingston? There's three reasons. Number one, the racial stratification of the Caribbean islands. See, in the United States, you either black or white. Even if you light skin, you black or white. Even if you got green eyes or hazel eyes or straight hair, 
you black or you white. We don't have an octoroon class. We don't have a quadroon class. We don't have a mulatto class. Now, socially, as self-hating Negroes, we might get into this thing of calling African people mulatto if they got a non-African parent, which I don't tolerate at all. Mixed race Africans are Africans too, as long as they identify with the race. As long as they identify with the race. So I don't play the mulatto thing, and mulatto is one of the most disrespectful things you could call a human being because it is a term originally used for animals. But in the islands, you had so many classes of color that to try to bring them all together under un one umbrella after the white man had convinced us to identify with skin tone made success for Garvey almost impossible in Jamaica. So Garvey decided to stay in New York. He goes and meets with Du Bois. He goes and meets with A. Philip Randolph, two great black men, but two stunningly jealous black men. They couldn't stand Marcus Garvey. And why couldn't black leaders stand Garvey? Because they couldn't understand how a black man, not even born in America, could organize black people better than anybody they ever seen in their life and nobody since. W.E.B. Du Bois said, Booker T is dead, I'm the new HNIC. And as soon as W.E.B. Du Bois started to walk up the steps to assume his role as undisputed HNIC, of black America, a short, black, nappy-headed man from Jamaica got off the banana boat in Manhattan and said, up, 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 you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will and organize more black people than any leader you can name. And what makes Garvey so great is he didn't have to use religion to do it. He is the only one he didn't have to create a religion or borrow one. Garvey used African consciousness. And under the banner of the red, black, and green, he was able to put together 13 million Africans, every continent, every country, every major city and nation. The most thoroughly organized southern state was Louisiana. The most thoroughly organized Caribbean country was Cuba. The most thoroughly organized African nation was South Africa. In fact, when the ANC was organized, it was Garveyites in the ANC who helped influence the selection of the colors of that particular flag. And it was Robert Zabukwe, the great Garveyite from South Africa, who broke with Nelson Mandela in the ANC because they said, South Africa belongs to all who lives in it. And Robert Sabukwe said, you must have bumped your damn head. Hello. South Africa don't belong to the Chinese. It don't belong to the Jew. It don't belong to the Anglo-Saxon. South Africa belongs to the black man. And Robert Sabukwe, the greatest Garveyite of South Africa, founded the Pan-Africanist Congress. Kwame Nkrumah. The great Kwame Nkrumah went to school in Philadelphia at Lincoln University and joined the UNIA in Philadelphia. Said the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey is the most influential book he ever read in his life. And when he led Ghana to independence, Queen Mother Amy Jakes Garvey was present there. The sons of Marcus Garvey, I believe both of them may have also been present at the independence ceremony of Ghana. Patrice Lumumba studied Garvey. Amakal Cabral studied Garvey. Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya said he used to go when he was a student in London. He would go to Hyde Park and listen to Marcus Garvey give speeches in the later years of Garvey's life. If there was no Marcus Garvey, there would have never been no African independence. So the first reason Garvey was so successful is because in America, he didn't have to do with the color schisms and hierarchy and codified legal skin tone differences of the Caribbean. 
The second reason Garvey was so stunningly effective in America, unlike he was in Jamaica, is because the pan-Africanists who came before Marcus Garvey had already laid the ideological framework for the success of Garveyism. What do you mean, Dr. Umar? Has anybody ever heard of African Methodist Episcopal Church Bishop from Georgia, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner? The first black man to say God was a black man. Elijah Muhammad went to a school as a child. So Elijah was influenced by two Pan-Africanists, Bishop Turner and Garvey. Bishop Turner was one of the first blacks elected to uh, public office during Reconstruction. He was the first black chaplain general in the Civil War. And they called him Marcus Garvey before Marcus Garvey. He died one year before Garvey arrived. Booker T dies a few months before Garvey arrives, but we're not going to stop there. Have you ever heard of Major Dr. Martin Robinson Delaney? He is the Pan-Africanist who said, Africa for the Africans. Marcus Garvey took Martin Delaney's words and added to Africa for the Africans those at home and those abroad. Did you know Martin Delaney was the first black person admitted to Harvard University Medical School during slavery? That's how brilliant that brother was. He was a father of the Masons, one of the first black newspaper publishers. He co-edited the North Star newspaper with my ancestor Frederick Douglass, but they split over ideological differences. He was good friends with white man John Brown who led the Harpers Ferry Raid. Martin Delaney, the first uniformed soldier officer in the Civil War. Martin Delaney, one of the first black men nominated by a major party for vice president of the United States. Why don't you know who Martin Delaney is? He laid the foundation that Marcus Garvey would walk on. Bishop Turner laid the foundation that Marcus Garvey would walk on. Have you ever heard of John Brown Russworm? Also from Jamaica? The first black man in America to get a college degree from New England? He published the first black newspaper in America, Freedom's Journal, the same year Nat Turner War took place, 1831. Even Jamaicans don't even know that there was a great Pan-Africanist before Marcus Garvey by the name of John Brown Russworm who laid the foundation for Garvey. What about Henry Highland Garnett, the first black pastor to speak to the United States Congress? Henry Highland Garnett who lost his leg. And even on one leg, he said Africans for the Africans. Henry Highland Garnett had one dream before he died and that was to go to Africa. He set sail for Liberia. He died in Liberia. John Brown Russworm is also deceased in Liberia. I went to go visit their grave when I was in Liberia and couldn't get into the cemetery. Why, brothers and sisters? Because the Liberian Civil War that took place a few decades led to the death of so many of our Liberian African brothers and sisters that they still have the casket stacked up. You can't even visit the grave of somebody who died in the 1800s because they still haven't properly buried all the brothers and sisters who was murdered during the Civil War. And every war in Africa is orchestrated and manipulated by the CIA. Every African leader is assassinated by the CIA. Alan Dulles, the CIA director, is the one who ordered the murder of Patrice Lumumba, and we have an airport named for him. Dulles International in D.C. is named after the murder of Patrice Lumumba. And I got to name one more Pan-Africanist before Garvey who laid that foundation, and I can be here forever, but that would be Alexander Crummel. Alexander Crummel is the father of black social work. If any of you are social workers, you have to look up Dr. Alexander Crummel, who was the first black man to get a degree from the unit from a Cambridge University in London, England. Grandfather of Pan-Africanism, father of black social work, grandfather of Pan-Africanism. And guess what else? 
He built the first intellectual society for black men in American history, the American Negro Academy, and one of his first students was W.E.B. Du Bois. See, W.E.B. Du Bois' issue with Garvey was not philosophy. W.E.B. Du Bois' issue with Garvey was not ideology. He was a pan-Africanist too. The issue was jealousy. How dare you show up in America after Booker T dies? When I had to wait for Booker T to get out the way to become the leader, and soon when I'm ready to become leader, here you come from Jamaica. No degree from Harvard. You ain't got none of my awards. But black people are listening to Marcus Garvey in a way they didn't even listen to the boy. They hated him for it. And what's the third reason Garvey succeeded in America where he couldn't succeed in Jamaica? Number one, we already said, the racial stratification. Octoroons, quadroons, mulattoes. Number two, the Pan-African Foundation was already laid for Garvey because Pan-Africanism was born in America and went to Africa. We are the fathers and mothers of Pan-Africanism. For my black sisters out there who love feminism, who's the mother of black womanism? Her name is Dr. Anna Julia Cooper, the greatest female Pan-Africanist all time of all time. This black woman is the first woman with a doctorate from Washington, D.C., the fourth black woman ever with a Ph.D., She's the mother of black womanism, the first sister to articulate an approach to the struggles of black women for equality with the man. Not Gloria Steinem, the mother of white feminism, who was financed by the CIA. How many of y'all know that the CIA invented feminism? The CIA financed feminism. Why did they want feminism in the black community? Why was it so important? to recruit black women into the feminist struggle. To tear down the black man and turn your back on the black man. That's right. They said, we got to keep these women from uniting with their men. We can't have black women fighting against mass incarceration. We can't have black women fighting against the unemployment of black men. We can't have black women fighting. So we're going to make them believe that the black man is his own problem. And now they're recruiting young sisters at the college campuses right now. Even up in Atlanta, Georgia, they got feminists all on them campuses. The CIA is planting feminists on every college campus to recruit black women for the feminist movement away from the Pan-Africanist movement. And what is the goal? I don't care if it's feminism, LGBTQism, or multiculturalism. There's only one goal, the destruction of the black family. Turn the woman against the man. Turn the child against the parent. Put this gender against this gender. Convince the boy to go to bed with boys and the girls to go to bed with girls. Here's the question, brothers and sisters. And whether you gay or straight, I still love you because I became a psychologist to heal my people, so I ain't got no hate for nobody, no matter what bag you in. But I reserve the right to disagree with anything that risks the survival of my race. Boy on boy love is a genocide pill for the black family. Girl on girl love is a genocide pill for the black family. They don't like you whether you gay or straight. But if they can get you to accept the indoctrination of same-sex relations for five-year-olds and six year Can I ask you a question? Children are not attracted to the opposite sex sexually until puberty. You don't start sexually thirsting for the opposite sex until your body starts developing the anatomy necessary to reproduce. Sexual attraction is mother nature's way of saying it's time for you to reproduce. So children are not thinking about reproduction until they go through puberty. 
So if children are not thinking about reproduction and the call of sex, which is an urge to reproduce yourself and reproduce your ancestors, why are we teaching five-year-olds about same-sex relationships? Why are we teaching six-year-olds about same-sex relationships? Why are we teaching seven-year-olds? So let me get this right. You don't know how to read yet, but you know how to use gay condoms. You can't count, but you know everything about transgenderism. And the black community is sitting by wasting money on everything else except building schools for your own children. Brothers and sisters, you know we have the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy up in Delaware. And I want to thank all y'all who donated and supported me. And I want to thank the haters too for the negative energy against which I fly. Brothers and sisters, we bought that school two and a half years ago. If I was a Mexican, if I was a Mexican, Dr. Umar Ifatunde, with my experience, my degrees, my expertise, and I had four buildings in two schools, modern schools, I will promise you the Mexican community would have rehabilitated that whole community the first year, that whole school. If I was a Jew or an Arab, I can guarantee you that whole campus would have been done for me and done for free the first year. But because black people do not value independence, you do not value independent institutions. You do not believe in building anything for yourself if the white man already gave you one. That's why our school's still sitting there. But I don't have a negative report, I have a great report. Because if all goes the way it's going right now, we just sent off for the $50,000 HVAC unit. We're not gonna get it to Halloween, but at least we'll get it. They say it take 90 days to make it, and with COVID, it might be even slower, but I'm hoping that the elementary school will be done by Kwanzaa. I want to have a grand opening week-long Kwanzaa celebration in the Garvey School. That's the plan. But before that, before that, brothers and sisters, I want to invite y'all up, all of you, except the haters and the coons. Because <laughs> everywhere I go, Baba Ochi, there's a hater and a coon. I don't know which one you are, but I know you here. You can't wait to go back on Facebook and misrepresent something I said today. Brothers and sisters, I want to invite you to the school next month. Four weeks from today, exactly. On Saturday, September the 11th, we are having our first community engagement, which will be the FDMG Black Power Block Party Family Festival. I want y'all to come. You can drive on up to Wilmington, or you can fly to the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania International Airport. Wilmington is Philadelphia's backyard. Delaware is Philly's little brother. The front door of our school is 22 minutes drive from the front door of the Philadelphia International Airport. On Saturday, September the 11th, from 11 in the morning till eight at night, we're gonna have performance. Vendors, free food, free t-shirts, book bag giveaway, a fashion show. The Universal African Dance and Drum Ensemble will be performing. Gil Scott Heron's band will be performing. Brothers and sisters, I want you to come and see the school for yourself. Because y'all been listening to the YouTubians and all the lies. So now you get to come and walk through yourself the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy so you can know that what we have is a gift from God. We just got to finish the work. I want you to see the Nat Turner Jean-Jacques Dessalines Gymnasium. I want you to see the Marcus Garvey Elementary School. I want you to see the Frederick Douglass High School. Once our school is fully renovated, we will be the largest independent black school campus in the country. And we will be the only black independent school with two real school buildings. And when I say independent, 
I mean in the truest sense of independence. That means no loans from white folks, no grants from white folks, no charter school, all that is government. We are independent, which means we're going to teach our children the way we want to teach our children. So I'm letting you know right now, we will be having a farm. We're going to teach the young children how to grow their food. We're going to have an agricultural curriculum. We're going to have a dietary nutritional curriculum. Teach them how to make their food. Remember when we went to school, we had home economics. They taught you how to cook. They don't teach these kids how to cook nothing in the kitchen no more, but we will. We will have a Marcus Garvey, Frederick Douglass Jr. gun club. Our sons will get their first gun from us and we're going to teach them how to use it responsibly. We're going to teach them fishing, hunting, archery, camping. Somebody asked me in Denver two nights ago. They said, Dr. Umar, what about the gay kids? I said, they can come too. Because by the time I'm done with them, there won't be no more sugar in that tank. We're going to build men at the Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey again. Ain't no such thing as a gay child. There's only a child confused at the thinking he's gay. How are you seven years old and you gay? You, know, huh? you six years old and you know you want to be a lesbian. That, that, that's, that's, that, that's the propaganda telling them that. I'm not even going to touch that word because you know if I touch that word, they're going to try to shut me down. All you got to do is raise African children the way they're supposed to be raised. Okay. And they will naturally gravitate to that which God intended them to be. You don't have to fight against nothing. Just raise them the right way. And their natural God-given spirit is shine on through. And once we're done with the boys, we're going to open up the girls' school too, ladies. That's going to come a few years later. But because we got two schools right across the street from each other, you will see them on September the 11th. We might be able to start the girls' school a little sooner than the boys' school. Excuse me, a little sooner after the boys' school. But I'm letting you know now, the girls got to be all natural, baby. No perms. No weeds, no extensions, no European hair. Unapologetically African. And ladies, if you want to work at the school, you got to be natural too. There won't be no perms teaching in my class. There won't be no wigs or weaves in my damn school, I promise you. And by the way, if your mother, if your husband don't look like your father and your wife don't look like your mother, you need not apply. How the hell are you going to be a role model for black children at a revolutionary black school and you sleeping with the enemy? The hell wrong with you? No snow bunny crisis. Brothers and sisters, we will teach them financial and economic science, the laws of money. They will come up with their own business plan. They will be invested in penny stocks as soon as they get to the school. We go into Africa every year. They will be taught to African languages before they graduate. Oh, we talking revolution. See, I don't give out my whole school plan because the haters want everything so they can make a video. I'm trying to find out how I don't have a YouTube page, but I got more videos on YouTube than everybody else. I'm not on TikTok and got more TikTokers than it. even white folks is making TikTok videos about. I saw a damn devil imitating me on TikTok. So brothers and sisters, Garvey starts publishing the Negro World. The Negro World newspaper is the most notorious black newspaper in world history. If you got caught with a copy of the Garvey paper in Africa or the Caribbean, it could cost you your life or life in prison. And then people say, why didn't Marcus Garvey go to Africa if he's such a pan-Africanist? They didn't let him. 90% of the African world was colonized by the white man in Garvey's day. Only Ethiopia and Liberia were free. He tried to build a home for Africans in the diaspora to come back to in Liberia. And W.E.B. Du Bois sabotaged it. And then after Garvey died, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a letter to Garvey's widow, Queen Mother Amy Jake's Garvey and said, I'm sorry. He apologized. Too damn late. Why do we hurt each other and destroy each other and sabotage each other? And then when we die, I'm going to write a letter to his wife. I'm sorry for what I did to help destroy your husband. Old leaders hating on young leaders. We got a whole history of that. 
I go through it my damn self. Malcolm went through it. Garvey went through it. Old leaders hating on young leaders. We have to learn how to share the throne. We're the only community that does not have an intergenerational transfer of power. We don't have that. White people have an intergenerational transfer of power protocol. They don't fight over who's going to be next. They have a system that decides it. Black folks, we got to fight over who's going to be next. Why you got 100 churches in Macon, Georgia? Because everybody loves Jesus? Hell no. You know why you got 100 churches in Macon? Because when a young brother got out of seminary school at 25, he wanted a chance to do some sermons on Sunday. But the 80-year-old pastor said, no, son, you got to wait your turn. And the 25-year-old said, but wait a minute, pastor, I'm ready now. I just got from Morehouse Seminary. Let me do one sermon, pastor. Pastor said, I built this damn church. And I'm going to die with my boots on. Y'all know how it go. So then the young brother got to go open his church, right? And that same 25-year-old, after he just experienced that, when he get 85, guess what he going to do? The same damn thing. So another 25-year-old comes to him and says, can I do a sermon? Can I run the Bible study? Nah, son, you ain't old enough. You don't understand this. We can't give you young people no power because y'all going to run it in the ground. And as a consequence of that, what do we have? 200 million churches because don't nobody want to share the pulpit 200 million black conscious organizations and they all got three members everybody split up a million Garvey camps a million more camps a million Hebrew camps a million Nation of Islam camps everybody want to be a chief Nobody want to be an Indian. If you don't know how to follow, you can't ever know how to lead. We need to create a system that selects the best person for the job without prejudice or personal feelings. Because until we do that, the black community is going to continue to function upon a system of anarchy and coup d'etat. Because that's exactly what we got in the black church. Anarchy and coup d'etat. Black conscious community, anarchy and coup d'etat. So, Garvey gets the Negro world popping. Then Garvey gets the Negro factories corporation popping. Garvey got the first black butcher ever in New York. One of the first black hotels ever in New York. First black woman to run for vice president, Charlotta Bass, was a Garveyite. And then Garvey says, you know what? If we really serious about black power, if we really serious about the black dollar, if we really serious about controlling our economic destiny, we have to build a distribution network. So Garvey came up with the most infamous project ever for a black leader, a fleet of shipping lines. The Black Star Line Steamship Corporation. It would be the greatest achievement of Marcus Garvey, and it would also be the greatest strategy of his haters to destroy him. Why did the white man have to destroy Garvey once he put ships on the water? When Garvey put that SS Frederick Douglass on the water, white man said, we got to stop this Negro. He done lost his damn mind. The reason they couldn't let Marcus Garvey operate a shipping line is because Marcus Garvey was undermining their control of the international black dollar. Marcus Garvey was undermining the white man's control over your ability to do business with black people who live in other continents. Do you realize, brothers and sisters, that 90% of everything you wear 90% of everything you eat, 90% of everything you drive, buy, or use comes on a shipping vessel today. That Mercedes Benz came on a ship. That caddy truck came on a ship. That damn weave in your head came on a ship. The microwaves, the iPods, the laptops, 
the big screen TVs, they all came on the ship. So Garvey said, we're going to control the black dollar on the open seas. So if you live in Macon, Georgia, and you sell water, and you want to sell your black water from Macon, Georgia to Jamaica, to Ethiopia, to blacks in London, to Jamaica, to Brazil, we got the ship you can do it on. Don't pay the white man. Don't pay the post office. Don't pay FedEx. Don't pay DHL. Pay the Black Star Line. And so the Black Star Line was the most revolutionary black economic program in modern history. No other organization has done anything like it yet on a global scale. They said, we got to stop this Negro. Because if he builds this Black Star Line, and black people no longer have to go through white people to do business with each other, white supremacy will fall overnight. So the FBI, which was not the FBI yet, it was called the Bureau of Investigation. They hired a little known homosexual white man who liked to cross dress like a woman named J. Edgar Hoover. And this little known white man named J. Edgar Hoover would get his first opportunity to destroy a black leader in Marcus Messiah Garvey. And J. Edgar Hoover would hire the first black undercover agent in U.S. history to infiltrate Marcus Garvey. If I could ask my ancestors one question about white supremacy, I would ask my ancestors, why did J. Edgar Hoover live so long that he was able to destroy every major black movement and leader we had, from Marcus Garvey to Fred Hampton. J. Edgar Hoover took down Garvey, King, Malcolm, the Panthers, the Black Liberation Army. Why the hell that devil live to take down every major movement and leader we had? A cross-dressing white man had a fetish for strong black alpha leaders. So brothers and sisters, they arrest Marcus Garvey and accuse him of selling fake stock. And the only piece of evidence they had to convict Marcus Garvey came from a Philadelphia coon named Benny Dancy who had an empty envelope with nothing inside. I want y'all to hear this. Marcus Garvey went to jail for two years and 10 months because a coon claimed that there was fake stock inside of an envelope, but he didn't have the fake stock that was inside of the envelope. So Garvey goes to jail on an empty envelope that was assumed to have fake stock inside. White people inside the court said we had never seen a black leader treated with such miscarriage of justice. How do you send somebody to jail without evidence of the alleged crime? But that's exactly what they did to Marcus Garvey, and the presiding judge was a lifetime member of the NAACP. The National Association for the Advancement of Certain Coons. Now, there's good people in the NAACP. I'm not talking about the members. I know some good soldiers, but they in the wrong movement. I know some damn good people in the NAACP, and every time I see them, I ask them, why are you here? The NAACP was founded by whites, controlled by whites, and funded by whites. And I know this because I was a member in Philadelphia, and I also started a chapter in college at Millersville University up in Pennsylvania. And it bothered me that every time we wanted to do an event, we had to make sure it wasn't too black. How the hell a black organization worried about an event being too black? I never seen the Jews say, this is too Jewish. I never seen the Chinese say, this is too Chinese. The Chinese are extra Chinese. They so extra that when you go into the Chinese store, you never see a help wanted sign in English. It's always in Chinese to make sure your black ass don't apply. Right. 
on some YouTube black. You on that pro black. Well, if I'm pro black, what are you, pro white? Damn coons. I'm walking through the airport, right? And it's a black man with his white girlfriend. They see Dr. Umar coming, right? He acts like he ain't with the white girl. He made a detour into the shop for some soda. Knowing damn well he was with mayonnaise. That's what I go through at the airport. Negro see me, shit, that's him, breakfast club. Let me go over here. If you ashamed to be with him, what you with him for? Seeing me shouldn't stop you. White girl come up to you, uh, are you Dr. Umar? Listen, uh, my husband's black, he loves you, but he's scared to ask for a picture because he don't know if you're gonna let him because I'm his wife. Why you got her advocating for you? Did you know in Garvey's day, you could not join the Garvey movement if he was married to a non-African? Now y'all consider me controversial in 2021 for saying that. Marcus Garvey said it 100 years ago. You could not join the UNIA ACL if your wife or husband was not black. You also couldn't join if you was an LBGTQ. A hundred years ago, that's how strict Marcus Garvey was. He was ahead of his time. So Garvey goes to jail. Two years, ten months. And then President Calvin Coolidge, President of the United States, who has some black ancestry in him, by the way. He commutes Garvey's sentence. He lets Garvey out of jail early. They take Marcus Garvey to Louisiana, the most thoroughly organized Garvey stronghold in America, and they deport Garvey to Jamaica. But what Garvey didn't know was President Calvin Coolidge's commutation of his sentence did not require what you call it, deportation. Garvey never had to leave America. Nobody told him until after he was back in Jamaica. His lawyer lets him know, Marcus, you didn't have to leave. He says, what do you mean they told me? They lied to Marcus Garvey to get him out the country. And once Garvey was out the country, the State Department never let him in ever again. The closest Garvey came to America after 27 was Canada, where he held several conventions and hosted his Course of African Philosophy, which was a leadership class for all aspiring leaders in the UNIA. Garvey is the first leader to create an educational system to train his replacements. Some people say, that black man was crazy. Why did he meet with the Ku Klux Klan? Why did the Honorable Marcus Garvey, the father of African race pride, black Pan-African nationalist, came right here to Georgia and met with the Grand Wizard of the KKK? W.E.B. Du Bois said, you are traded to your race. A. Philip Randolph said, what the hell is wrong with you? NAACP told black folks, stop listening to Marcus Garvey. He down there making deals with the Klan. Nothing could be further from the truth. Garvey met with the Klan for one reason. For those of you who don't know this, the first organized black military in America was not the Black Panther Party. It was not the fruit of Islam. It was not the Deacons for Defense. It was the Marcus Garvey African Legion. Garvey built the first black military. And that black military was an armed military that was regularly engaged in war with the KKK. The KKK was killing Garvey Legion, and Garvey Legionnaires was killing the KKK. Georgia, Louisiana, Virginia, Carolina, there were shootouts between the red, black, and green and the red, white, and blue. And so Garvey's meeting with the KKK was no different than when George Bush sat down with the president of China. It's no different than when Joe Biden goes and sits down with the president 
of South Korea. We not friends. We don't like each other. We here for one reason, a ceasefire. We don't like y'all and y'all don't like us. But as long as y'all want to keep on killing innocent black folks, we gonna keep on killing y'all. And so Garvey's meeting with the Grand Wizard was a ceasefire. They came to an agreement that if you leave us alone, we leave you alone. Marcus Garvey said, quote, I met with a white man who was unapologetically a white man, and he met with a black man who was unapologetically a black man. We wasn't friends before we met. We wasn't friends after we met. We met for one reason, to look out for the best interests of our respective races. See, y'all don't understand that. Because you don't deal in power. You don't deal in diplomacy. You don't deal in global politics. Garvey was leader of a government meeting with the leader of another government on how we can stop the bloodshed. You better study Marcus Garvey's African Legion and the African Guards of Garvey. In fact, Marcus Garvey gave the black woman the first female military in the Universal African Motor Corps. Black women was armed and ran their own movement. In fact, Marcus Garvey believed so much in the equality of the black woman that in the UNIA Constitution, every division of the Garvey movement was have a man president and a lady president. Did you know that, ladies? That's right. No other organization requires there to be a lady president right next to the man president. All the rest of them got you taking notes and cooking food, not using your brain. Garvey said the black woman is much more than a bertha of babies and a cooker of food. And Garvey made her a leader. And he embarrassed the U.S. government by making the black woman a leader, so much so that white women would write to the U.S. Congress complaining. How do you not let the white woman vote in elections in this country? But here's a black king of a black government inside of Madison Square Garden holding a convention, the Honorable Marcus Garvey. And the women are treated the same as the men. The women can be elected just like the men. And every woman can vote and every chapter must have a lady president. You think it's a coincidence that the white woman got the vote in America 1920, 1921? That ain't no damn coincidence that the white woman got the right to vote in 1920, 1921, because those were the Garvey conventions. The government of America had to catch up to Garvey, and that's why the white woman got the vote. Take that to your next feminist meeting. The Council on Foreign Relations was founded in 1921 by the Rockefellers to do what? Disrupt Garveyism. Brothers and sisters, when we say we are Garveyites, we're talking about the highest stage of revolutionary pan-African nationalism. We believe in independent black political power, independent black economic power, independent black educational power, cultural power. Garvey says, do it for yourself. Don't go begging a white man for no rights. Don't go begging a white man for no changes. Don't go begging a white man for new schools. Build your own. Garvey's whole movement can be summed up. Black man, do for your damn self. Why do you think I'm building them schools? You don't think Dr. Umar Johnson can get a charter school in every state with my credentials and background? Hell yeah, they give me a charter school in every state. What I want that for when the white man can take it from me whenever he feels like it. You know why black folks got distracted with the charter school movement, Georgia? We got distracted with the charter school movement because we was fighting for community education control. Y'all remember that? In the 70s and 80s, what do we want? Community control of the public schools, but we gave it up. Because when those white women in Minnesota came up with the charter school idea, thirsty community control of public school activists said, wait a minute. Did you know with the charter school you can make yourself the CEO and pay yourself $100,000 a year? You sure you want this community control? Because these white folks are getting charter schools and they making themselves 
CEOs, and they never got to do a day's work. Can I ask you a question? If you got 100 students in your charter school, why do you need a principal and a CEO? Paying somebody to do your work while you get a free check. That's why black people love charter schools. It's not that they all love our kids. Charter school is the best hustle around because you can pay yourself a big salary and never do no work. Oh, yeah. But you don't control the charter school. Charter school is owned by the state. And more black charter schools are being closed down every year because charter schools was never for you. It was for white folks. And when they want to shut down a black charter school in Georgia, what do they say? Test scores are too low. You've had your charter for five years. Your children are still underperforming, so we're going to take your charter back. Reason number two, you do not have enough white teachers in here, and I don't see enough homosexual teachers in here. So since you are violating the multicultural clause of charter schools in Georgia, we're taking your charter. And what's the third reason they shut you down? The number one reason, financial mismanagement. Even though you got a $2 million budget, you're missing 19 cents from last year's budget. And since we can't find the dime and nine pennies, we have to take your charter. Do y'all know that the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is inside of a former charter school that was built on a $13 million budget? by a very good brother I know who's an attorney in Wilmington and former city council president, but some white folks in Dover, Delaware didn't like him. So after he spent $13 million to build that school, they gave him a charter for two years and then shut him down. We had the Imani Circle Charter School in Philly, one of the oldest ones, shut down. Every day I'm getting newspaper ads from all over the country. Black charter schools shut down. Garvey would say, you should have never built them in the first place. Garvey would say, the only thing you control is what you make with your two hands. That's why Garvey say, to be a black organization, it must only have black people and black money. If you belong to a black organization that got nine black people in it, it ain't a black organization. And if you belong to a black organization that's taking money from nine black people, it's not a black organization. I'm not condemning you, but just don't call yourself unapologetically African. Everybody feel like they need a white person next door. Brothers and sisters, as I wrap up the Garvey portion of this, I want to say a word about the children, education. When does school start back up in Macon for the children? When did they start? What date? August the 2nd? The day before Edward Wilmot Blyden's birthday. Grandfather, Pan-Africanism, Secretary of State of Liberia. He was the greatest black scholar until W.E.B. Du Bois. I want to close by saying when we honor Garvey, we honor the ability of black people to take control of their destiny. When we honor Garvey, we honor the belief in the red, black, and green and our ability to become a free people. Brothers and sisters, why are we begging white folks to do for us when we are a $2 trillion people? If you want an independent community, there's over 12 cities for sale in America. Why are we not buying enough? Let me say that again. There's over 12 cities for sale in America. Why are we not buying any of them? Let me do a quick search for y'all. Because I'm tired of us acting like we pro-black, but we only see it when we talk. Cities for sale. Because we love to talk about Black Wall Street, don't we? Tulsa, Oklahoma, we just celebrated in May 31st, the Tulsa, Oklahoma City bombing, Wilmington, North Carolina bombing, Rosewood, Florida bombing, Charleston, South Carolina bombing, all these independent black communities influenced by Garvey, make no mistake about it, there were Garveyites at the heart and soul of all those great black Wall Streets of the 1920s, that was Garvey's work. 
11 towns for sale in America. Johnsonville, Connecticut, 1.9 million. The whole town. The bank, the school, the hospital, everything you want. Calnary, Nevada, 8 million. Hell, Michigan, 900,000. I guess that one is cheap because it's hell. They got a KKK chapter. We can run their asses out. Garvey did it. The Legionnaire ran the clan out. Pray Montana, 1.4 million. You will have to pray. That's why they call it Pray Montana. Then we got Henry River, North Carolina, 1.4 million. Toomsboro, Georgia, right here. They got a hotel, a syrup mill, a railroad depot. You can buy it outright. We put it up for sale. The developer put it up for sale in 2012, but it don't list the price. Y'all need to be looking into Tombsboro. Don't let the name scare you. Right here in Georgia, y'all got a city for sale. What we doing, black people? Gary Owen, Montana, 250000 dollars A whole city for $250,000 in Montana. You're going to need a lot of guns and a lot of bullets. Cut it out, but we can do it. What else we got? Scenic, South Dakota, $799. The whole city. The whole city. I'm uh, Scenic, S-C-E-N-I-C, -C. Scenic, South Dakota. We got any black cowboys out here because we're going to need your ass out there. Buford, Wyoming, $900,000. Sweat, South Dakota. $250,000. Look at that. A whole city for a quarter million. If we want, to, if we really want to be free, why are we not making no moves? If we really want to be free, why are we not making no moves? And who keep calling me while I'm speaking? Probably a cone. Jesse Peterson. Jesse Lee Peterson. Brothers and sisters, we have to get back to our Garveyism. We have to get back to inter-ideological solidarity. One of the things I want to do at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy is I want to have a conscious community leadership roundtable. I want to bring the Moors and the Hebrews and the Nation of Islam, the guys and Earths, all the conscious organizations, the Wapians. And I want us to sit down at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood and find out what we can do together as a movement. Because the conscious community is looking like a bunch of hypocrites because we claim that we are the alternative to the church. But we have become more churchical than the church. We have become more judgmental than any religion I know. The church might judge you, but they still won't let you in and pray with you. Not the conscious community. Sister, you show up in there with the wrong earrings, they will read you your rights. Brother, you show up in there, you ain't got the right shea butter in your locks. Vegetarians, eat your ass up. We have to learn to stop being so judgmental and come down together to the table of brotherly and sisterly love. Now, after Garvey dies in June 10th of 1940, at the age of 53, Khalid Abdul Muhammad died around the same time. Booker T. Washington died around the same time. A lot of our great black leaders left us in their 50s, and I think a lot of it had to do with, number one, they worked themselves to death, and number two, the coonism of the black community took so much out of them that they left early. Booker T had more black enemies than white ones. Garvey had more black enemies than white ones. Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad had more black enemies than white ones. And that's why they left us early. But with that being said, I'll close with a quote from Garvey. But it's important for y'all to know this that after Garvey dies, the children of Garvey, El Hajj, Malik El Shabazz, Malcolm X, 
whose father, Earl Little, Malcolm X's father, was a president of a Garvey division. He was murdered by the Ku Klux Klan doing work for Garvey. Malcolm X's mother, Louise Little, was a contributing writer to Marcus Garvey's Negro World. And guess what? It was Malcolm X's father. It was Malcolm X's father who wrote the letter to President Calvin Coolidge begging for Garvey's commutation of sentence. Malcolm X's father led that. Minister Farrakhan's family was populated with Garveyites. Minister Farrakhan wrote a letter to the UNIA one year when Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad was the keynote speaker for the UNIA convention. And I'm giving you the words of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, who said, when I was a child, I saw a picture on the wall of Marcus Garvey. And I asked my uncle, where is that man? And the uncle said, Garvey died. And Minister Farrakhan said, he cried. I'm giving you his words. Much respect to the Minister Farrakhan. Much respect to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who was a member of the Garvey movement in Detroit and Chicago. And that's why the Nation of Islam was founded in 1930, three years after Garvey went to jail. I see Garveyism everywhere. I see Garveyism everywhere. Would have been no Black Panther Party without Garvey's Universal African Legion. Dr. King went to Jamaica. Even Dr. King went to Jamaica laid a wreath at the ground of Garvey's grave and said, this is the first black man to give us a universal program for liberation. After Malcolm died, King went to Garvey land, came back from Jamaica, and Dr. King been sounding like Marcus Garvey ever since. The spirit of Marcus Garvey got into Dr. King, brothers and sisters. That's why they had to kill Dr. King. And had Malcolm been left alone to live, he would have finished Garvey's work. Malcolm was coming back to the Garveyism that his parents raised him on. Marcus Garvey said, in a world full of wolves, one should go armed. And the most powerful weapon in the reach of Negroes is the practice of race first, wherever we live. Garvey said, Without confidence in yourself, you are twice defeated in the race of life. But with confidence, you have won even before you have started. Garvey said, God never intended us to be a race without a country. And we are not going to abuse God's confidence in us as men. Marcus Garvey said, the greatest protection of African people is nationalism. He said, don't call yourself equal to the white man if you're not doing for yourself what the white man is doing for himself. Marcus Garvey was once asked, are you African or are you Jamaican? Are you African or are you Jamaican? And Garvey said, you ask me, am I African or am I Jamaican? And I tell you, I would never give up a continent for an island. I am an African. Brothers and sisters, all the grandmaster teachers of our people were friends of Marcus Garvey. Did you know that Carter G. Woodson used to write for the Negro world? Did you know Zora Neale Hurston used to write for the Negro world? Did you know Arthur Schomburg used to write for the Negro world? Did you know Dr. Yusuf Ben Yachinen was a card carrying member of the UNIA ACL? Everybody who was anybody, was down with Garvey. Now, with that being said, I want to talk to the parents, because school, school just started, and I already know y'all out there cooning. And what do I mean when Dr. Umar says, I know the parents are out there cooning? I'm going to give you my last 15 minutes. Give me 15 minutes, and we want to go to questions, and then... I could take pictures and sign books if you didn't get a copy of my book, Sister Kiera has them inside, Black Parent Advocate. I want to give you parents in Macon, Savannah, Columbus, Atlanta, East Point. My, 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 my family is from uh, 
Blakely. Anybody familiar with Blakely, Georgia? Okay, you from Blakely? Anybody from Blakely, Georgia here? You know people, that's where my mother's people come from. Blakely, Georgia, the Shoemake family. I was born Jermaine Shoemake. My father changed my name because my mother named me after Jermaine Jackson. And my father hated Jermaine Jackson. So he said, woman, if you want to be my wife, <laughs> we're going to change this boy name. So one day, Jermaine Shoemake was outside playing at 16th of Susquehanna, and my father called me in the house. And I came in the house. I was about seven or eight, bow-legged as can be. And he said, from this day forward, you are no longer Jermaine Shoemake. You are Umar, Rashad, Ibn, Abdullah. Johnson and the windows blew open and 20 birds came in there and I saw the ancestors dancing until I went back to school with my new name and I was half I got a new name. They said, what is it, Jermaine? They used to call me May May. May May, what's the new? I said, Umar. They said, what's that? All my friends called me Kubar and Fubar and Tubar. And I said, can I have my own name back? He said, no, because you are not a Jackson. <laughs> so brothers and sisters, let me talk to the parents. Parents, I'm going to give you all 10 things that I don't want y'all to do this school year. These are the 10 do not do's. Number one, do not get black children evaluated mentally or educationally for anything seven years or younger. Did y'all hear what I just said? I don't want to hear about no five-year-olds getting tested for ADHD. I don't want to hear about no six-year-olds with reading disabilities. I don't want to hear about no seven-year-olds with math disabilities. I don't want to hear about no eight-year-olds with emotional disturbances or autisms. You know why? The younger your child is, the more likely they've been misdiagnosed. Did y'all hear what I just said? The younger the child, the harder it is for the school psychologist, which is what I am, to determine if the disability really exists. You can't prove autism in a five-year-old. Some of y'all got kids diagnosed with autism at five. How do you know it's autism? They're only five. Well, the school said I should get them tested as soon as possible. Who can tell me why the school wants you testing them as soon as possible? Money! They want that money from the state. Because special ed comes with a subsidy. Special ed is a business. Special ed is a hustle. Special ed is a racket. Special ed is a program of making money off black kids. You know you never talk. How's she autistic at four? Don't you know that could be a hearing problem? Don't you know that could be a speech problem? Don't you know that could be social anxiety? Don't you know that could be selective mutism? Don't you know that could be emotional? Or sexual abuse reaction? Don't you know that can be low self-esteem? Don't you know that can be a child who was raised with a different language in a household? Who told you it was autism? You cannot prove autism in a four-year-old. They might have some symptoms. That don't mean they have the whole disability. Slow down, black parents. Stop being so quick to label your child. Stop thinking that the label is a solution. The label is not a solution. The label is not a solution. Y'all get your child an IEP. I think y'all solved the problem. Oh, he got a reading disability. He's going to get pulled out for two hours a day for some one-on-one. -on -one. His ass ain't going to get no one-on-one. -on -one. You know why? Because there's 60 other kids in there who need one-on-one. -on -one. And you go in some of these schools in Macon, you got more kids in a special class than a regular class. Yep. If you know like I know, I would never put my child in special ed. I would get them a tutor, brothers and sisters. A tutor. Two days a week, 90 minutes each day will eliminate any reading or math problem your child got. All you need is a retired teacher, college student, high school student. You don't need no damn IEP. ADHD. Do not get your children evaluated for ADHD. The minute they say, we think he has it, you tell them. Are you a licensed psychologist? Ask the teacher that. Ask the principal that. Ask the social worker that. Ask, 
Are you a licensed psychiatrist or licensed psychologist? Oh no, I'm a certified principal. I'm a licensed teacher. So you're not trained to diagnose mental illnesses, are you? No, I'm not. So why do you think it's okay for you to diagnose my child? And then you write a letter to the principal and say, your teacher told me my child got ADHD. That is illegal for a teacher to operate outside their expertise. The next time that teacher brings up ADHD to me, I'm going to make a complaint with the State Department of Education that you are letting teachers give out psychiatric advice to parents. Stop letting them bully you around. ADHD ain't nothing but ain't no daddy at home disease. ADHD ain't nothing but ain't no daddy at home disease. That's right. He don't need no drugs. He needs his father. That's what he needs. But the white man locking up all the black men, he can. The only black men safe in America are the gay ones and the transgenders. Am I wrong? All the alpha males in prison. All the alpha males are in jail. The only black man that's on the streets is the ones with sugar. ADD. When do we get ADD? 1980. Attention Deficit Disorder. 1987. It becomes Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. There's only one solution in America for ADHD. What is it? Ritalin. What is it? Adderall. What is it? Concerta. What is it? Vivance. Crack! His father is in jail for selling crack, and now you're going to let the schools give it to his son? The same crack. The same crack that locked his father up for selling it on the street, you can now give it to his son so he can learn about Christopher Columbus quietly. You don't ever give your child no damn drugs. They kill their brain cells, mess with their organ, will stunt their growth, will cause them to ball, can cause tick disorders, psychosis, homicidal thinking, and suicidal ideation. Excessive weight gain, excessive weight loss, can't go to sleep, can't wake up. Stop giving your children drugs. And if you don't believe in helping your children, you don't believe in getting them evaluated either. Did y'all hear that? When they ask you for the eval, say no. Black mothers, can you please learn how to just say no? Black fathers, can you please learn how to just say no? Black grandparents, can you please learn how to just say no? I don't know what it is with Negroes and white folks, but soon when you walk into the school, you just turn into a zombie and you start doing whatever the hell they tell you to do. Well, it's true. The parent can qualify for SSI. You don't automatically get it, though. And I need y'all to understand that. If you take my psychological evaluation to the Social Security Administration, they must review it, but they don't have to accept it. Their psychologist has to agree. And if you don't agree, you don't get the money. And guess what? A lot of kids are no longer getting SSI for ADHD and reading disabilities because they know it's all a scam any damn way. Why did they invent special education in 1975? They invented special ed in 1975 because the white schools still had not desegregated and they needed to find a way to get these white schools to take these black kids during the busing movement. So they told the white kids, listen, white schools, take these black kids. You can se separate them once they get inside. Once they get inside. And then the white school said, well, how am I going to do that? Supreme Court said it was illegal. Government said it's illegal if you say you separated them because they're black. So don't say you're doing it because they're black. Say you're doing it because he got a reading disability, a math disability. He's intellectually disabled. He's emotionally disturbed. As long as you give that black boy a label, you can segregate him from the white kids. Special education is the Resegregation Act of America. Special education is the Resegregation Act of America. And I'm telling all you black parents right now who got your kids in special ed, don't be surprised when you try to put them in a private school, independent private school, and they refuse your child. In the United States of America, a private school does not have to take a child with an IEP. Let me say it again. In the United States of America, a private school does not have to take your child. That's right, if they got an IEP. Uh-huh. See, not listening to me gets you in trouble, don't it? Because you want to take him out of the special ed class, and you want to put him in a private school, and the private school going to get the record, and the record going to have an IEP,
in a private school who don't want your kid anyway because he's black is going to say, we're sorry, but your son has an IP for reading. Now, you know he ain't really got no reading problem. They did that for behavior, which is illegal, but you let him do it. So now the private school can refuse you. Disabilities ain't never helped nobody. I'm still trying to find out what's so special about special ed, and I'm the one who put them in there. And y'all come to the school trying to beat me up for not putting your kids in special ed. What's wrong with him? Who is you to tell me my child ain't got a reading disability? His father had a reading disability. I had a reading disability. His big brother had a reading disability. Reading disabilities run in my family. And then I got to say, listen, coon. Reading disabilities do not run in your family. They didn't even exist until 1975 when the white man made them up. With that being said, let me tell you what runs in your family. You know why his daddy had a reading disability and you had a reading disability and your oldest son and oldest daughter had a reading disability? You want to know what really runs in your family? Poor parenting runs in your family. No homework runs in your family. No bookshelf runs in your family. Weave, perm, basketball, and house and, and bas and uh, react what housewives runs in your damn family. Coonism runs in your family. See, let me tell you what I do when I evaluate your kids. Let me tell you what I do. I don't lie to the kids. See, the white psychologists, they lie to them. Even the black ones. I tell them, this is what it is. Your son come to me, your daughter come to me. I'm gonna say, do you know why you in this office? They're gonna say no. Your mother or father told these white folks that you need to come to school on the yellow bus. Do you know what the yellow bus is? Yeah, that's the slow kid. Yeah, uh-huh. Your mother told them crackers that you need that class, that special class, in order to learn. Do you agree? I'm not slow. Ain't nothing slow about me. But you got all Fs on your report card. Well, that's because I don't really try. Well, guess what? You got one chance. I'm giving you one chance today to liberate yourself. I'm going to give you an IQ test. I'm going to give you a reading test. I'm going to give you a math test. I'm going to give you a visual motor test, adaptive behavior test, emotional assessment, psychological assessment. I'm going to look at your records. I'm going to observe you in the class. I'm going to interview a teacher. I'm going to talk to your parents. And I'm going to look at all your scores. If you score high today, you stay in the regular class. If you score low today, you come to school in the cheese bus. Do you understand? So I do the eval. Child is motivated to do their best. Guess what? Scores come back off the chart. I give the report to the principal, right? And the principal is asking me, are you sure this is the same child? I'm very sure. And then the mother and father is saying, no, it ain't. He be on YouTube. He's a black radical. He made that up because he don't believe in special ed. And a mother like, that ain't my son. My son ain't never scored higher than grade level. I said, oh, yes, he did. And then they say, how do you explain why he scored so high with you, but scored so low in the class? Because I gave him an offer he couldn't refuse. Do your best or come to school in the cheese. <laughs> It was motivated. See, at the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, your children are going to be motivated. Because the first day of school, you know what I'm going to tell all the kids? All of them. You got reading prompts. You got math prompts. You got autistic prompts. You got ADHD prompts. You got conduct disorder prompts. You got oppositional defiant prompts. You got intellectual disability prompts. No problem. Guess what? All my slow kids come to school on Saturday and Sunday from 8 in the morning till 8 at night. Since you need extra help, I'm going to give you a little coon ass all the extra help you need. So here's the question, brothers and sisters. Who would have bet me $100, Baba? After two weeks, I won't have no more special aid. I won't have no more reading. I won't have no conduct problems. I won't have no emotional disturbances. All my problems will be wiped out. Because don't nobody want to be in school for 12 hours on the weekend. And guess what? At the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, if you score too low on that test, you don't go home. We will have a dormitory 
for your failing ass. And you're going to stay on campus until you pass the damn test. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. And for those of you whose sons don't live in Wilmington, Delaware, we will be having extracurricular camps, retreats, seminars, conferences, and symposiums for all black boys. So you will be able to drive your son up to Wilmington, fly your son up to Wilmington, we'll get him at the airport, put him on Amtrak, put him on the mega bus, hell, put him on the Chinese buses, $20. And he could come to our camp, come to our retreat, and come back home. So we're going to have something for every black boy, even if he can't physically be in Wilmington, Delaware. Also, we will be building a virtual platform, brothers and sisters. That means that your son can still be educated in the class by way of laptop in the house. He'll be able to sign in, see his teacher, see his classmates. His classmates and teacher can see him, but he will be required to come to the campus four times a year to build relationship with his classmates because we're building families. FDMG is a lifetime family. If you come to the block party on Saturday, September the 11th, make sure you go to fdmgfestival.com to register. It's free. You don't have to pay to come. fdmgfestival.com is how you register. You will get a chance to fill out a form that lets me know you're interested in having your son in our physical school which means you have to move to southern New Jersey, southern Pennsylvania, northern Maryland, or Delaware, because Wilmington is where PA, Jersey, Maryland, and Delaware all meet. Or he can come to the virtual school. And we will be having virtual programs for the girls too. And not only will we have the school during the daytime, brothers and sisters, we will be having events for the adults. International African Women's Conference, Ex Offender Conference, Black Farmers Conference, Black Business Conference. And because y'all got so much shea butter, black women, I'm going to have a damn shea butter conference. I'm serious. All the shea butter. Just break it all at one time and get it over with. Break me all the shea. Strawberry shea, lime shea, whole tap shea, George Bush shea butter, every kind of shea butter. Brother, and then we're going to have a CMOS conference. Because y'all crazy over CMOS. We're going to have one day of nothing but CMOS so y'all can leave me alone. <laughs> and then I'm going to have a haters conference. I'm going to let all my haters come one time to just tell me what they think. And then kick their ass up out of me. I'm going to have an interracial lovers rehabilitation conference. You addicted to white girls, we're going to re-Africanize your ass. There you go. We're going to have something for everybody, just like Marcus Garvey. Next thing as I close, don't go to no school meetings by yourself. Don't sign no paperwork unless you read it. And if you're not sure what to do, ask Dr. Umar. That's what I'm here for. If your child is evaluated and you don't agree with the results, you have a right to a second opinion and the school got to pay for it. All this is in a new book, by the way. So I don't ever want to hear you say they put my child in special ed. I didn't know what to do. I just told you. you get your child out of special ed whenever you feel like it. You don't need an IEP. You might need a 504 plan. The 504 plan gives the child's accommodations. IEP dumbs down the learning. If your child can learn in a regular class, why is he with an IEP? Get him a 504 plan. Why doesn't the school tell you about the 504 plan? Because they get paid for special ed. They don't get paid for respecting your child's civil rights. White people bullying your child. They keep singling your child out. He's dealing with racism in the school. Write a letter to the United States Department of Education Office of Civil Rights. There's a division of civil rights within the United States Department of Education whose job is to investigate racism against minority children in the schools. Your child been getting speech and language therapy for five years, still stuttering, still can't talk. That means they're not getting a quality service. That means you're going to call an IEP meeting and demand 
that they give your child private speech therapy because the public speech therapists don't know what the hell they doing. And they owe you comp ed for all the years the child was getting speech, but it wasn't helping the child. They got to pay you reparations for that. It's called comp ed. And if they really did a bad job helping your special ed child, you can make them pay for your child to go to a, pu a private school at public expense. If any of you ever have a child who's classified as intellectually disabled, Dr. Umar wants to see the e eval. I don't charge you for that. If you get a report saying your child's intelligence is below average, I want to see it. Why? Black children are four times as likely as white kids to be called retarded when they're not. And too many of you will accept anything the school says and run with it. Stop believing the disability. Let me see the report. Take out your phone, I'm gonna give you my phone number right now. You can, all, you can text me for the information, for the block party, if you wanna vend, you can vend. If you wanna perform, you can perform. Wilmington, Delaware, Philadelphia International Airport, 20 minutes away. You can get a hotel at the Wilmington waterfront where Harriet Tubman used to bring our ancestors. Remember, Harriet Tubman came through Wilmington, Delaware more than any other place, because her main white benefactor, a man named Thomas Garrett, is buried five minutes from our school. He was also born on August the 21st. Anybody ever see the famous painting of Harriet Tubman on the back of the wagon with her parents? Yeah. Guess who gave her the wagon? The white man in Wilmington, Delaware, Thomas Garrett. He buried five minutes away from the school. We share the same birthday. Who else came through Wilmington, Delaware? Frederick Douglass, when he escaped from Baltimore, he came to Wilmington, then he went to Philly. Who else came through Wilmington, Delaware? Henry Holland Garnett, I mentioned him earlier, father of Pan-Africanism, first black preacher to speak to the U.S. Congress. Thomas Garrett helped his family escape from Maryland through Delaware. Who else used to come to Wilmington, Delaware every summer? Bob Marley from Jamaica. Bob Marley and his mother had family in Wilmington, Delaware. He used to vacation there every summer and used to work at the construction yard. Who else came through Wilmington, Delaware? The Honorable Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line. Where was the Black Star Line incorporated in 1919? Wilmington, Delaware. I met a brother whose grandparents was the one who took Marcus Garvey's papers to Dover, Delaware to incorporate the Black Star Line. 1919. When did we buy the school? 2019. No coincidences. My phone number is 215-989-9854. Nine eight five eight. I repeat it twice. Two one five. Nine eight nine. Nine eight five eight. One more time for my special ed parents. I'm picking with you. Two one five. Nine eight nine. Nine eight five eight. Text me if you ever get a letter from the school. You don't know what the letter saying. All you got to do take a picture with your phone. Text it to me, Doctor Umar. I just got this letter. Can you tell me what this means? Because this ain't making no sense. Because let me tell you what the schools do, parents. They don't use the word special ed no more. Because they know I've been teaching y'all. So they don't even put it. They just say, your child might need to be screened for extra help. Please sign here. Don't sign. That could be a back door to special ed. Don't sign it. Remember, whenever you have to sign something, that means they're about to do something special to your child. Y'all got me? Whenever you got to put your signature, they're about to do something special. Remember that. Also, also, mothers, stop telling your personal business to your child's teacher. Your child's teacher is not your counselor. Your child's teacher is not your life coach. Your child's teacher is not your therapist. Too many black women are building relationships with the teacher failing to realize that the school is the new prison and the teacher is the new police. And anything you tell that teacher can and will be used against you. That's why some of y'all losing your children. Child Protective Services of Georgia. We got to take the kids. Why are you coming to get my kids? Because the teacher told the principal that you said you're a recovering drug addict. The teacher told the principal that your boyfriend almost killed you in front of your kids. The teacher told the principal that you live in your mama's basement with four kids. The teacher told the principal that your kids are hungry and homeless. Keep your business to yourself. They are not your friend. The other thing I need to stop doing. Do not sign the release of information form. Have you ever seen a release of information? 
It is a form that the school gives you to sign for your child, giving them permission to talk about your child behind your back to the pediatrician, caseworker, therapist, behavior specialist. Never sign release. We want to talk to your daughter's therapist to see how she's doing. That's none of your business. I'm the parent. That's my business. Well, we want to talk to the therapist. No problem. I will schedule a time where me and the therapist can come into the school and we can all sit around the table and talk about my son. But I do not let white people talk about me behind my back. And speaking of vaccinations, your child don't have to be vaccinated to go to school, right? There's religious vaccination. There is medical vaccination. And there is personal family belief exemption, religious exemption, medical exemption, personal family belief exemption. I want to see what Georgia, Georgia is not on the list for personal family belief. I live in Pennsylvania. We have personal family belief. So if I don't want my daughter to get vaccinated, all I got to do is write a letter to the school that says, I don't trust white people. I don't trust your vaccinations. My daughter won't be taking it. No, thank you. And she goes to class. Y'all don't have that in Georgia. So in Georgia, you got to have religious exemption or medical. So y'all got to find you a doctor who will exempt your child, or you got to find you a religion that don't believe in exemption. Now, you got to check, because New Jersey has religious exemption where you don't have to prove the religion. In New Jersey, a parent can say, my religion doesn't allow me to vaccinate my child, and they have to accept it. The school has to accept it. Find out if Georgia has a no proof religious exemption. If Georgia has a no proof religious exemption, all you have to do is write a letter saying, my religion doesn't allow my child to be vaccinated. They do? All right, so there you go. I don't believe in vaccinations. I'm telling all my elders right now, stop getting vaccinations. Do not take that flu shot, elders. That flu shot killing y'all. The older you get, the more toxic the flu shot becomes. All you need to do is change your diet, Get you some garlic, some onions, some cayenne, some B vitamins, grandma's chicken noodle soup. But I better not catch your ass in the line at Walgreens because I'm going to call you cool. I get tired of seeing the elders walking to the damn Walgreens at the end of the summer trying to get that damn shot from the oppressor. And I don't believe in COVID vaccinations either. DMX took the COVID shot. Rumor has it, Renoco may have taken the COVID shot. Cicely Tyson took the COVID shot. Hank Aaron took the COVID shot. Marvelous Marvin Hagler took the COVID shot. And they all became ancestors within a couple of weeks. So I'm telling you now, if you're 65 years or older, do not take the shot. And if you're under 65, I recommend you don't take the shot. They are killing us. That COVID ain't nothing but a cover for black genocide. Look at all the people we losing. I'm getting text messages every day. Dr. Umar, my mother died from COVID today. They said my father had the Delta variant. And see how they keep coming up with all these damn variants? Today is Delta. Tomorrow's going to be the Christopher Columbus variant, the Dylan Roof variant, the Thomas Jefferson variant. They got a whole bunch of diseases and they just letting them out a little bit at a time. Try to kill as many black folks as they can. And then they say Africa has the lowest COVID rate. I wonder why. You know why Africa has the lowest COVID rate? Because many of the African presidents refuse the testing and refuse the vaccination. Why do you think the president of Tanzania did? John Magafuli, rest in peace. They killed him. This brother said, okay, I don't believe this COVID stuff. So guess what he did? He tested a piece of fruit, an animal, a goat, a piece of fruit, and a flower. And they all tested positive for COVID. How the hell do the goat got COVID? How the fruit got COVID? How the flower got COVID? He proved that they set the test up to give you a false positive. He dead now. The president of Haiti who was assassinated, refused the vaccinations. Now he is dead. They going around the world killing any black leader who refuses to force their people to take the vaccination. You see what New York City doing? New York City says you can't go to a restaurant unless you got the shot. I'm 
not taking the shot. Marcus Garvey would say, if you had your own restaurant, you wouldn't have to worry about it. If you had your own hospitals, you wouldn't have to worry about it. Guess how many hospitals black people once owned in America? Over 500 hospitals. Did y'all know that? Over 500 black-owned hospitals in American history, and you hardly got any now. Because you want to depend on white folks. And now you got Negroes running around talking about, I want some reparations. I want some reparations. Well, guess what? I believe in reparations. Marcus Garvey is the father of modern reparations because he's the first one to petition the government to turn over to African people the former German colonies of Africa after World War I. Garvey started the reparations thing. But guess what? I don't want you Negroes getting no reparations because y'all haven't shown me that y'all serious about using that money to liberate black folks. You're going to get that money, go get you a new Benz. You're going to get that money, go get you a sex change. You're going to get that money, go get you a white girlfriend. You're going to get that money, go get you a Kim Kardashian uh, slavery bicentennial weave job. Listen. <laughs> Listen. Reparations is for the whole race, right? It's for all the ancestors who died. It's for those of us who live in. It's for black people who ain't even been born yet. If you give that to us right now, you know damn well, we will blow that damn money. So let me give you Dr. Umar's reparation plan. First of all, if you got a white wife, you don't get no damn reparations. If you got a weave in your damn head, you ain't getting no reparations. If you live in a white neighborhood, you ain't getting no reparations. If you got a white Jesus on your wall, you ain't getting no reparations. No coons will get no reparations. So that's rule number one. I want you to know right now, if you're cooning, you won't get no cash. Number two, first thing we want in the reparations, control of the publishing and exclusive rights to all black music since we've come to America. I want Michael Jackson's catalog. I want Prince's catalog. I want Whitney Houston's catalog. I want... Sam Cooke's catalog. I want all the oldies. Why do I want black music? Music is America's second largest export. Do you know what that means? This country makes more money off music than almost anything else it sells. If we own the publishing, if we own the advertising of the music, we can build a black Wall Street everywhere in America. I want music. I don't want no damn money. What else do I want in my reparations? I want an investigation into all the land that was stolen from black people from slavery to reconstruction. Give us our ancestors' land back. What else do you want, Dr. Umar? All black inventions are the permanent property of black people, and if somebody wants to use, if somebody wants to use something we invented, they have to license it from us and pay us. That means the cell phone that we invented, the elevator that we invented, the internet that we invented, the helicopter that we invented, the radio that we invented, the refrigerated truck that we invented, all the medications that we invented. These lights are going to come on when it get dark outside. Who created that technology? Dr. Lewis Latimer, a black man who taught the white man how to light up an entire city at night. And Louis Latimer was asked by China to come to China, and he taught the Chinese how to light up China at night. And then they asked him to come to England, and he taught the English how to light up the city at night. And then they asked him to come to Canada, and he taught the Canadians how to light up the city at night. A black man did that. So give me back everything I created, America. That's the kind of reparations I want. What else do you want, Dr. Umar? Of America's 10 leading export materials, 25% of the revenue comes to black people. Spring water, oil, iron ore, wood. These are some of America's top exports. We get 25% cut on everything y'all sell. What else do I want? And I'm going to end on this one. I want a prison where we can send our coons. <laughs> We're going to have a female coon prison and a male coon. we got to get rid of the coons. They belong to white people now. They don't belong to us no more. Give them back to their owners. And the last thing I want, 
more than 50% of all black people are concentrated in 10 states. More than 50% of all black people are concentrated in 10 states. What are those 10 states? North Carolina, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, Georgia, Texas, Florida, uh, Illinois. How many did I just name? It's 10 of them. Most of them are on the East Coast. And they are all adjacent to water. Ah. So the 10 states where we predominate, we must own and control the major seaport in all 10 of those states. Anything come in, we get paid. Anything go out, we get paid. And most of all, we can make sure the white man not bringing nothing into that seaport that's going to kill us off. No crack, no guns, no food poisoning. And guess what? We're going to have some ships waiting. So when it's time to get the hell up out of here, we're going to put some rims on that damn ship and we out. <laughs> I'm dead serious, brothers and sisters. We got to have a contingency plan dealing with these crackers. See, it's something y'all don't understand. All white people are racist. Did y'all know that? Yeah. He got quiet in here. Because yeah, yeah. in church, you're taught to love everybody who believes in Jesus. Yeah. Did you know that the men who rode those slave ships believed in Jesus? Yeah. All white people are racist. All of them. The little kids, the old people, yeah. the Christians, the Muslims. The liberals, the conservatives, the Democrats, the Repo all white folks are racist. The reason you don't understand that is because white folks know how to make you think they're good people. They laugh and smile and play with your kids and give you free food and hold conversations with you on the bus. White folks don't like you. White folks can't stand you. And they're all racist. And they don't have to hate you to be racist. So you think they got to hate you. They don't have to hate you. Racism is not about hate. Racism is about what? Power and control of the resources. That's it. They can have sex with you. They can give you your kids. They can marry you. But guess what they will never do? Give you control of the opportunities and the resources. All white people are racist. And until you understand that, you'll never be free. Because every black person has 10 good white people who you love and trust. And that's why I don't trust you. Because I don't trust black people who trust white people. See how easy that is? See, I love being Dr. Umar because I don't get into no gray areas with nobody. Because everybody know what I stand for. She's white. I don't like you. Why your six-year-old daughter got a permanent head? I don't like you. Why you still got a white Jesus on the wall? I don't like you. So they already see me coming. I ain't got to have no debates. No arguments. And when I get around white folks and when I got to put my suit on and go to work, I always put a radical black button on my lapel. So the white girls don't think I want them. Because you Negroes love these white girls so much, they think every black man wants their little nasty man they self. Amen. I'm getting on the elevator and all the white girls looking back to see if I'm looking at their behind. But you don't have any behind. So what are you looking for, Sally? Long ass bag. Long See, bag. <laughs> as I close, I want to give you a quote from Frederick Douglass. And I'm really hoping to see you guys at 9-11. We're going to take some questions. Don't go nowhere. Frederick Douglass said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. He said, a man may not get all that you work for, but you will work for all that you get. Frederick Douglass said, the limits of tyrants are prescribed by the people they oppress. We decide how poorly our oppressors treat us. Frederick said, for 20 years I prayed on my knees to God for freedom, but the good Lord gave me no freedom until I got up off my knees. And start praying with my feet. He said, if you want respect from white people, why do you look for pity? The man who pities you will never respect you. The man who respects you has no need for pity. My family came to America in 1701. Black man named Bell, he's stolen from Nigeria, most likely, according to the research. He was brought to Talbot County, Maryland. He married a black woman named Selah, for whom my 10-year-old beautiful daughter is named. In 1745, they had Grandma Jenny. In 1774, Grandma Jenny had Grandma Betsy, born a slave in Talbot County, Maryland. She marries a free black man, Grandpa Isaac. 
they had 12 children. One daughter was named Harriet, and my five times great-grandmother was named Young Betsy after her mother. These two sisters were raped by Aaron Anthony, the white man who owned my family. As a result of the rape, in February of 1818, Aunt Harriet gave birth to the greatest black leader in American history since Nat Turner, Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey. Cousin Fred ran away in 1838 at the age of 20. He changed his name from Fred Bailey to Fred Douglas to hide his identity. In June of 1819, my four times great grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey, was born. This is the same Stephen that Frederick mentions by name when you read his autobiographies. He says, I grew up on Tuckahoe Creek with Cousin Stephen. Cousin Stephen is Dr. Umar's four times great grandfather, Stephen Henry Bailey. When the Civil War takes off, Frederick doesn't fight, but he sends two sons, Lewis and Charles. They go to Boston, Massachusetts, and they fight in the 54th U.S. Colored Troops of Massachusetts. If you ever seen the movie Glory, Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, that's the story of my cousins, Lewis and Charles Douglas. And guess who else was there? Martin Delaney's son was in the 54th Massachusetts. My grandfather Stephen married Grandmom Caroline. Grandmom Caroline didn't learn how to read until 1909. She was also born into slavery. Their firstborn son, my grandfather, George Washington Bailey, was born November 14, 1841, 10 years after the Nat Turner War. He becomes the first black public school teacher in Denton, Maryland. Grandpa Stephen and Grandpa George enrolled in the United States Colored Troops of Maryland. Grandpa Stephen was with the 19th Regiment. Do you know what that means? What does it mean that my grandfather Stephen was in the 19th Regiment of Maryland Colored Troops? That means on June 19th, 1865, when Gordon Granger read, rolled into Galveston, Texas, and read Special Order Number 3, giving birth to Juneteenth, my grandfather was there. After the Civil War was over, my grandpa George marries Grandma Annie. They have Grandma Caroline. Grandma Caroline moves to Philadelphia. She has Grandma Vivian. Grandma Vivian marries a Spanish-speaking Cuban immigrant, great-grandfather Cicero. They have my Grandma Ida, who passed away two years ago. She meets and marries James Johnson. They have Jamal Johnson. He meets and marries Barbara. And on August the 21st, in the ghettos of North Philadelphia, the anniversary of the Nat Turner War, the Haitian Revolution, the George Jackson War, the Fugitive Slave Convention, Dr. Umar Johnson was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, with one mission, to liberate African people and vindicate the ancestors. I'll leave you with this. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman, when she was old, they interviewed her, and they asked her, were you ever afraid of taking all those trips to the South to liberate Africans? She said, no. There were times I almost got caught, and whenever I almost got caught, I called to God to liberate me, and God would find a way for me to get up out that situation. I almost died many times. But if I would have been captured, I would have not been fearful. I would have not cried to God. I would have accepted that as a message from the Almighty that I had done my job and it was time to go on home. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman freed over 300. She is the only woman in American history to lead soldiers into battle. Let me say it again. Queen Mother Harriet Tubman, born Araminta Ross, is the only woman in American history to lead soldiers in war when she did it during the Civil War in South Carolina, which resulted in one of the largest single emancipations of enslaved Africans in con Confederate service. And guess what? They never paid Queen Mother. When Queen Mother Harriet Tubman wasn't being a nurse and a spy and a scout, she used to cook for the soldiers. She used to heal their cuts. She was a herbalist, so she used to treat disease, and that's how she made money, because the government paid her nothing. And when Harriet Tubman retired, she applied for a soldier's pension. And this woman, who's the only woman to lead soldiers in the battle, was denied a government soldier's pension. Isn't it ironic that right now, they want to put Queen Mother Harriet Tubman's face on the $20 bill? Over a hundred years after she died, now you want to put her face on the money, but you ain't want to give her the money 
that she earned to liberate your damn country. They asked Queen Mother Harriet Tubman, do you have any regrets on the Underground Railroad? And Queen Mother Harriet Tubman said, one regret I have. She said, I freed hundreds of slaves. I could have freed thousands more. The problem was, they didn't even know they were slaves. If they didn't know they were slaves in 1850, how the hell do you know now? Black power making Georgia. I love y'all. What I want to do right now is go right into the Q&A, because I caught the African Holy Ghost today in the name of Garvey. I spoke longer than usual. Any questions, raise your hand. I'm going to give you a number. Don't forget your number. Let's start with five. You're number one. Do we? You're number two, Queen. Queen number three. Baba, you number four. Baba in the suit, number five. Number six. Number seven. See how black folks do? They start slow. And number seven. We gonna stop right there. Who's my number one? Go ahead, Queen. I'll repeat your question. What are your thoughts on critical race theory? What are your thoughts on critical race theory? Me and Baba Oshi just had this conversation on his show the other day. Here's my opinion on critical race theory. I don't have a problem with American school children being taught that the enslavement of African people is the central guiding event in the evolution of American history. I don't have no problem with that. That's called truth. You know what I got a problem with? I got a problem with all these black scholars who feel that they got to get approval, acceptance, and validation from the U.S. government before they can teach the truth. If you believe in critical race theory, why do you need white folks to give you a stamp of approval? Why do you need white folks to tap you on the head and say, good job, nigga, go teach it? Why can't you teach it yourself? Now, let me give you the answer to that question. The reason all these black scholars who push in critical race theory want the white man's approval is because if they get the white man's approval, they can go national with the program, which means they get to make several million dollars off the curriculum and several more million dollars off the books and several more million dollars off the workshops and several more million dollars off the speeches. The point that I'm making is I think the critical race theory scholars are financial opportunists. They want the white man's approval because if the government approves it, they can bill every university who teaches it. If I believe in critical race theory, I can teach it right here at the Homeland Village Cultural Center. I don't need the white man's approval. I can teach it at the Black College. I can teach it up in Atlanta at the Shrine of the Black Madonna. I can teach it at the UNIA. I can teach it at the Nation of Islam, the Gaza and Earths, the Nawapians, the Hebrews, the Moors. I can teach it anywhere people are willing to learn. So why am I holding it up for white approval? Because I want to get paid. Them Negroes ain't nothing but opportunists. You heard it from me first. Who's my question number two? May I ask two questions? Yes, you may. Okay, the first question is, Marcus Garvey, was not he a huge proponent and advocate for black people leaving the Americas and going back to Africa? And is there anyone in today's uh, black world that still holds that vision that leaving America and going back to Africa is the best choice for the black man and black woman? Excellent question. Let me answer this queen's question, and I'm glad she brought it up because I left it out of my presentation. Central to Garveyism and all Pan-Africanism is repatriation. We believe that until Africa is free, no African can be. Some of us have to go to Africa to work from that side for the liberation of the race. That's what Henry Holland Garnett did. He repatriated. John Brown Russworm, he repatriated. Edward Wilmot Blyden, he repatriated. But I want to be clear with you, Queen. The Honorable Marcus Garvey never, ever, ever endorsed a wholesale 
return all American Negroes to Africa plan. Did everybody hear what I just said? In fact, I want to quote Garvey for you. He said, quote, some of you Negroes are no good right here in America and will likewise be no good in Africa. I have no intention of returning all Africans to the continent. Neither do I. Could you imagine if Dr. Umar brought a big black star line ship to Georgia and I let every making Negro get on that boat with weaves, perms, white girls, transgenders, video games, big screen TVs, weed, crap, white Jesus, hell no, hell no. Ain't no coons repatriating to Africa on my watch. I believe in a systemic repatriation where you get interviewed by a council of elders and others and we decide who we think is psychologically ready to go to Africa. You cannot send all American Africans back to Africa because some of us have been so Europeanized that Africans have to kill us off to get rid of the menace. You have to send people who have serious African consciousness and only send people who are going to invest in Africa and not steal from Africa. Because a lot of American Africans are going to Africa, they're getting rich, but they're not doing nothing for Africa but rob it. I believe in systemic repatriation. I don't believe we all go to the same country. Ghana is getting crowded because it's the only country black folks in America know. Ghana. I love Ghana. I love it. But we can't all go there because it's going to get too crowded. There's other countries that need us. Gambia needs us. Zambia needs us. Ethiopia is the third poorest country in the world. The cradle of civilization needs us. Botswana needs us. Sierra Leone needs us. Kenya, Malawi. We have over 50 countries. And guess what? Anybody plan on going back to Africa? Go to the countries that are in the worst condition. There you will have the greatest impact. If you go to a country that ain't struggling, it might be difficult for you to break in because they don't need that much help. But you go to like an Ethiopia, they're going to roll the carpet out for you because there's so much that they need that we can do for them. Here's what I want. I want to take 50 of us to one country. All the different expertise. A doctor, lawyer, engineer, psychologist, investor, architect, all the skills. Farmer, all the skills. Buy a big piece of land, about 50 acres, and build a black Wall Street on African soil. That's what I want to do. And I'm working on it now. I'm going to talk more about it on 9-11. Because I don't want to die here. I want to be buried over there. I don't be buried over here. Okay? That's how I'm going to do it. Okay? So, what's your second question, Queen? But yes, we believe in repatriation, but not for everybody. My second question is about your virtual school. I'm going into my fifth year of homeschooling. I have a son. It has been tumultuous, and I've run into a lot of obstacles with curriculum, with pricing, and I'm wanting to know when is your virtual schooling going to be up and running? I know I said I have one more question. It's okay. And the last question, I hope you would just give clarity on Black Lives Matter because a lot of people, black people, I feel are deceived by that movement. Very good questions. You're a very deep thinker. You might need to get in contact with me and help me organize the national black homeschool movement that's going to go along with FDMG. But let me say this to you. Are you familiar with Dr. Mwalimu Baruti? Have you heard that name? He is the author of The Effeminization of the Black Male. He used to teach at Morehouse, I believe, in Atlanta. Him and his wife run a very successful homeschool network in Atlanta. Do you know his name? I can hear you. Marcus Klein in Chicago. You need Dr. Baruti. Uh, Baba Oshi, you still out here? He might have went inside. Does anybody have Dr. Baruti's information? 
Get it from the queen mother. You need to call Dr. Nwali Mubarudi. He's the answer to your questions on the homeschool. Also in the inside, okay? Your third question, Black Lives Matter. When I last spoke in St. Louis, I had an opportunity to speak to the real founders of Black Lives Matter. For those of you who don't know, the original Black Lives Matter was started by a group of brothers and sisters in Ferguson, Missouri, in the aftermath of the Michael Brown police assassination. It was a grassroots movement. A group of feminist lesbians seized on the popularity of the local Black Lives Matter, and they moved quickly to incorporate and patent the name as their own. So they stole all the momentum from something that was owned by the people, and they turned it into a pro-LGBT black power front for money. Black Lives Matter, and if you don't believe me, go to their website. If you don't believe me, go to the website. Read them. They are an LGBT advocacy group. They are not a black liberation organization at all. Read the website. One of the founders just quit after being accused of using money to buy a home. In her defense, I haven't seen anything that absolutely confirms that that money was BLM money. She claims to have had her own money, and I'm going to take her word on it until proven otherwise, because I do believe in innocence until proven guilty. But what I also know is Black Lives Matter has raised almost $100 million and have not given the black community an accounting of how they spent that money. None of the families who lost people was given any type of subsidy from Black Lives Matter. And I personally find that insulting, that you made all this money off the death of their loved ones, and you won't even do a one-time disbursement to help the families of these police genocide victims. With that being said, I have spoken at Black Lives Matter events. I have marched in Black Lives Matter protests. If you don't believe in the organization, Dr. Umar, why did you do that? because I believe in the young people at the bottom who don't have the political consciousness that I have. And because they believe in Dr. Umar, I think it's more important to walk in solidarity with our next generation of leaders rather than turn my back on them and having them thinking they're doing something wrong. So when the young people call me, I don't care if they NAACP, Urban League, Black Lives Matter, I don't believe in none of those organizations, but I believe in the young people. And I know that if I continue to march with them, sooner or later, I'm going to be able to bring them to the good gospel of Garveyism. Thank you for them questions. Who's my number three? Number three. See, this is what's wrong with black people. Can I make a confession? I have held post-lecture Q&As on every continent on this planet with black people, except Australia. And guess what? I've been speaking for over 20 years. I have never had a Q&A when you Negroes didn't forget your numbers. Can somebody tell me why black folks? They can't remember their numbers in South Africa. They can't remember their numbers in France. They can't remember their numbers in Canada. They can't remember their numbers in China, Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, Trinidad. No way I've been yet have I had a Q&A and African people can remember one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Interesting. I'm going to give you three. Go ahead, Queen. Hi. Peace Dr. and love. Dr. Umar. Yes, ma'am. I'm an educational consultant okay. with my own um, business, Focus Now Educational Consulting. And the acronym stands for Focus on Creating Unlimited Success Now. With that being said, and you, and you would be a virtual advocate for those aforementioned uh, situations that some of the parents may find themselves in. And one of the services I do provide is I will go to those meetings. I have gone to those meetings with the parents, advocated for the child and the parent, and prevented uh, one of my students from being labeled special ed. And the situation was the teacher was not doing her job properly and um, I would like to form a network with you to help um, 
parents across the country to be better for, better advocates for their kids and not form a national advocacy program where we empower parents to uh, do what they need to do for their kids. I was yes, indeed. In 2016 in Baltimore, I founded the National Independent Black Parent Association. And I want every parent here to hear me well. To organize our parents and help them advocate for change until we have our own schools in the seven areas of special education, school discipline, school policy, school finance, social support, homeschooling, and parent advocacy. We do not have any chapters in Georgia. Let's have a conversation because perhaps you can be the president of my first chapter here. With that being said, and we need more than one because no chapter can have more than 15 schools. So you will choose 15 schools and you're responsible for the parents in those 15. And so we need another president for the next 15 and another president for the next 15. So each city will have multiple chapters to keep the work manageable. With that being said, I need to come back to Georgia and I have to do my Black Parent Advocate 12 hour Know Your School Right boot camp for the parents. I want all y'all to know that I will be back before the year is out to do a 12 hour training. Anybody can get it. You don't have to be a parent. Fellas, I need more of y'all there because it's the women always showing up. The brothers never get the training to learn how to protect our sons. We start at 8 in the morning. We go to 8 at night. You are at tables and chairs. I give you paperwork. You're going to get a stack of paperwork like this. I'm going to give you the whole special ed law. I'm going to give you the whole IEP code, the whole 504 code. You're going to get a whole packet that is yours to keep forever. That's your advocacy paperwork. And then I'm going to train you every disability. Train you 504. Train you psychological eval. Train you federal investigation. Train you free and appropriate public education. By the time you're done with me, from 8 in the morning to 8 at night, we will give you breakfast and lunch. You will be an expert advocate. Let's have a conversation. Let's find out where we need to do the training at, and let's do it. Okay. All right? Your name? Marvella. I Sister agree. Marvella. Yes. You're the only Marvella I know, so I won't forget you. Yes. Let's do that. One more. Sure. As I ride around, especially like right down the street. And you're from this city? Yes, I'm okay. from this city, yes. I, right down the street um, on Napier Avenue used to be a very more vibrant area. And now it's crumbling. Um, a lot of businesses have moved from West Macon to North Macon. With that being said, how can we organize a movement to stop this gentrification and all this other stuff that is uh, disabling our communities where it looks like a ghost town? First thing we got to do is we got to convince black people that owning property is better than selling property. Too many of us can't wait to sell. And it doesn't make any sense because guess what? You sold a home that you own. You sold a home that you own. After you sell the home that you own, because property is much more expensive now than it was when you bought that house, you're going to end up with another mortgage. Why did you give up a home you own to take out another mortgage? The reason they call land real estate is because it's the only thing that cannot be duplicated. You could duplicate the automobile. You could duplicate the television. You could duplicate the cell phone. You could duplicate food. You could duplicate clothing. You can't duplicate land. That's why it's called real estate. It's in limited supply. How can you build a black Wall Street when you don't have a concentration of black land owners? Now, I want to come to another point before we go to the next person. We need to open up a Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey right here in Macon School for our boys. In order to do that, we got to find the school. So I need y'all to keep your eyes open. But let me give you this, though. Let me give you this. 
in Detroit, there's hundreds of closed down schools. When I started looking for a school, guess where I went? Detroit. Spent more time there than anywhere else. And guess what I learned when I was in Detroit trying to get one of them schools? They would tell me that the good ones were not up for sale. And then when they gave me the list of schools that was for sale, it were the worst schools. No roof, no back, basement flooded with water. And I'm like, what about that school over there? It's not for sale. Here's the point. As y'all look for these schools in Macon, please be conscious of the fact that the school you have in mind, they may never sell it to Dr. Umar Johnson. So we have to look at multiple schools, but this is what we're gonna do in Macon. They not gonna know I'm the buyer. The mistake I made in Detroit is I was my own front man. You feel me? I'm walking in there with a big ass arm. I'm Dr. Umar, I want a school. They went on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, he don't get no school. That was the problem in Detroit, Chicago. So we find a school and make it. I'm going to use what he ought to be my front. They don't even know it's me until we own it. And I'm, I'm assuming that the land is relatively reasonable around here. Am I correct? Yeah. Correct. So we need to get one of these schools and we need to get one quick. Go ahead. The school's still there? How long the charter school been gone? So the school in pretty good condition. Find out who owned it, find out what the asking price is, and then text me. I'm ready, even though we still build in Delaware, I'm ready to get another one popping somewhere. I got you a couple. Okay, let's do it. I got you a couple already off the top of my head. Okay, so shoot me uh, shoot me some numbers. We'll do. Uh, costs, and then I'll come back down and take a look at them, because if we can get one, let's do it. Because guess what, y'all school here might require less than what we're doing in Delaware, it might get started here faster than there. I'm open to it. We don't have to wait for one to get done to go to the next. Put them all in motion. We in a crisis. State of war. State of emergency. Let's do it. Yes, sir, Bob. Dr. Umar, there is a, um, I've been watching television lately, and just about every household in America has a TV, if not three or more. And every commercial that comes on television, I've been seeing signs of, uh, 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 hints of being gay, yep. lesbian, yep. this and that. Or how interracial. Can, or interracial. How can we protect ourselves from seeing stuff like that on a daily basis, but also protect our kids? Marcus Garvey, build our own independent black entertainment network. BET should have been a savior, but it became a sin. Because it was all about black exploitation and gangster rap. We need our own black entertainment. And we need it like yesterday. And when you look at the amount of time that black people spend watching TV, I can't believe we don't have our own one. Now, the Black News Network, I thought was black, but I heard that's owned by non-African. So we got to build our own black entertainment. There's some brothers from Africa who live here who have their own news networks. I'm in conversation with some of them to see what we can do to birth a national black news network with nothing but positive, progressive content. But also with that, black parents have to learn how to turn off the television. Y'all letting y'all children watch stuff that they should not be watching, and they are being conditioned. No black girl should be watching Housewives of Atlanta. It's the worst thing for a black girl, because they are conditioning her to believe that all black women are thirsty, negative, evil, opportunist, materialistic, and lazy. Turn it off. Black boys got to stop watching it as well. Stop letting the news, excuse me, stop letting the media condition your children. If it was up to me, any home with a child who has not yet graduated high school wouldn't even have a television in it. Use books. You don't even need the TV. But please limit the TV time and limit the video game time. Because I'm trying to find out how you got all these kids who can't read, but they can play video games for eight hours a day. Something ain't right. Your child is failing classes, but he got a video game system. How does that work? So we got to get a little bit better with our parenting. And the reason they pushing same-sex and interracial uh, marriages in the commercials and the shows, they're conditioning our kids. They're trying to convince black girls to abandon a black man, and they're trying to convince black boys to abandon a black woman.
get somebody of your same gender or go outside your race. That's the message. We can't win if we don't turn that television off. TV is one of the greatest weapons of white supremacy because they can get inside your head without even being in your house. Programming. Programming. Turn the TV off. Remember, the brain is the slave of repetition. Whatever you constantly feed your brain, your brain will believe whether it's true or not. And that's why we have to turn off those televisions. Who's my number five? Yes, sir, brother. Hey, what's going on, Dr. Johnson? Thank Peace. you for uh, taking the time to uh, spend and uh, educate our community. Uh, the question I want to uh, ask, actually, um, it's a follow-up from your earlier quote. Um, the Harriet Tubman quote, which we've all heard, I could have freed 100, I could have freed thousands more. That directly reminded me of my community, my city. When we go back to the founding of our city and how Nathaniel Macon and Benjamin Hawkins and Mercer University uh, used slaves and indigenous labor to build this city. And since then, the city has been sitting on what, on what is essentially a plantation. We're 59.7% of the population here, but our mayor is white. We're 59.7% of the population here, but our sheriff is white. We have all white judges. We have majority white commissioners. And so I guess my question is two part. It, is, it deals with the political side, but also deals with the capitalistic side. How do we wake up our brothers and sisters here in Macon and get them to break this plantation mentality that puts us in a position in our city where we're asking folks for permission to do stuff when we are the ones in the majority? That's the first part. The second part is, how do we stop the preying on our communities? If you go up and down the street, in each and every last one of these stores, they're all owned by Patels. This whole Patel phenomenon became a big thing in making about 10 years ago when they just started buying everything up in the hood. And you may have more um, knowledge of this being from Philadelphia and the more diverse communities. But now, folks are literally being plenty in our community, selling crack pipes, selling every single dangerous ailment that our community faces and not getting away with it. And I'm not even going to touch on the, on the gambling machine. So how do, we, how do we wake up that black political power and how do we run dangerous actors out of our communities? Number one, where is the black community central committee for change? Every neighborhood needs a black community central committee for change. People who we choose to be our mouthpiece and representatives to the power structure. Because as far as these aliens selling materials that are dangerous and hazardous to our community's health, that can be shut down real easy. Number two, the mayor being white, that shouldn't have happened. But we shouldn't be so quick to turn it to a black person unless we're going to finance that black person. Because if you don't finance the black mayor, he'll be worse than the white one. you got to finance him or it's not going to benefit you. Most importantly, we need a black economic acquisition community whose job is to create a list of institutions available in Macon that we need to buy so we can become independent. Where's the black community's laundromat? Where is the grocery store going to be? Where's, go where's the clinic going to be? All right? Where's the school going to be? We have to get organized. The most honorable Marcus Garvey said the greatest weapon used against the Negro is disorganization. We have to get organized. So the next question is, where will that meeting be held? Where will the first meeting be held and when? Will it be here at Homeland Village? Should it be somewhere else? We need to decide that. And we need to decide it right now, to be honest with you. Because we don't need another week, another month, another year to go by and nothing gets done. So in the spirit of Marcus Garvey, when and where can we have that next meeting? Are they still meeting Queen Mother or?
Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. So get with the queen, all right? And as she said, you always have two groups, your undercover group and your above ground. I'm above ground. I don't do undercover. I go hard. I'm Ogun. I go straight. Right? So I'm one of them brothers who we don't hide. We don't care if the white folks know who we is. We going hard. But then you have another group that they never see. It's how the Black Panther Party and the Black Gorilla Family operated. Right? The Panthers were above. Black Gorilla Family was below. They was the ones who did the dirty work that nobody else wanted to do. And y'all know what the dirty work is. You got to have that. Every community has the dirty work game. I call it the ski mask club. The black community is the only community that don't have a ski mask club. When people don't know how to act in the community, they get a visit. Right? Yeah. Nation of Islam would probably be the best example of a ski mask club in recent time. Right? But we need a modern ski mask club. Because everybody needs to know that when you don't treat the black community right, whether you black or white, there's consequences for that. If you do, if you can't hold people accountable, you will not be respected. And the reason why we kill each other, shoot each other, throw trash on the street, beat up women, rob the elders, is because there's no group who's responsible for administering black community justice. You gotta have a ski mask club. Thank you for that, my brother. Who's my number six? King. Thank you for taking my question. Um, is it selfish to have three? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, first of all, my name is Everett. And uh, I'm 31 years old. And in my 31 years, I don't think I've ever seen like a spiritual white person. I don't think I've ever seen one. There's no such thing. Yeah. yeah. And I don't Melanin know. Melanin deficient people cannot reach the level of dark matter okay. that is necessary in order to connect with divine consciousness. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that the rest of the world is so jealous of us as African people is because we yeah. are God's first child. So we're the chosen and the most blessed. Okay. All Africans. We've been brainwashed into believing you have to be a Christian to be chosen or Muslim. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with your ancestry. Yeah. We are the chosen ones. And because of our ability to produce melanin and to activate that melanin electrically and organically, we can go to the deepest level of spirit. We can get as close to experiencing God as is possible. The white man can intellectualize cosmic consciousness, but he can't achieve it. The East Indian can intellectualize cosmic consciousness. Very few of them will ever achieve it. The Buddhist, the Muslim, the Christian, we are hated because we can actually achieve God consciousness. White man can write about it, study it, intellectualize it, research it, he can never achieve it. His melanin deficient state prevents him from ever reaching that level of divine science. And that is also a reason why he reacts towards the planet and other people, especially us, with such contempt. This is why he's such a murderer, a killer, a disrespecter, and an exploiter. It is his reaction to the fact that Mother Nature did not give him the opportunity to experience God the way that we can. That makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. You know, that's why we should not reproduce with them. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly why you do not reproduce with alien groups because you weaken your child's ability to connect to cosmic consciousness. I'm dead serious. When you make a baby, those are two groups of ancestors coming together. Can I ask you a question? Why in the hell do you want your ancestors to have a conversation with Adolf Hitler, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, and all these other devils for? You don't know who that white person got in their damn ancestor line. 
And now your child is forced to carry that yeah. with them for their whole life. It is not spiritually healthy for African people to reproduce outside of ourselves. And if you Christian or Muslim, you should know better. Because your holy books specifically tell you that the chosen of God do not intermix with those who are not chosen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know what's crazy? That wasn't even the first question. So the first, that was like a part of it. I was, I was just saying that. Did it? Did, do spirituality have a uh, have a part playing in this? My question was because it's like it's biblical for the amount of people, white people who do it. Why do white people smoke so much? Like because not I, all white people smoke. <laughs> I think, I, but I will tell you this: yeah. speaking from a psychologist's perspective, yeah, white people as a group suffer way more psychopathology than anybody else. For example, who has the highest suicide rate in America? Rich, white, middle-aged males. Who has the lowest suicide rate in America? Old black women, the elders. So why is the privileged white man more likely to kill himself than you or me? All the hell black men catch? You would think we had the highest suicide rate. White men kill themselves, kill themselves way more than black men and don't go through half the hell. See, we have to get to a point where we understand that God chose us and that God is not happy with us being in the condition that we are in and that our ancestors are waiting to help us, but they can't do the work for us. We have to do it. They will be a help. They will be an assistant, but they cannot be the vanguard. The whole spiritual universe is waiting for African people to reclaim our destiny. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, my second question is, uh, and I really, I'm, I don't mean any disrespect to his ancestors or anything. Uh -huh. um, why do you think why do you think God allows such a traumatizing and dehumanization, dehumanizing hell that African slavery was last so long? God didn't allow it. Okay. God didn't allow it. I want everybody to hear me. Okay. God did not put you through slavery. You put yourself through it. Okay. Our African ancestors knew what the white man was doing. They knew he was coming, and we ignored it till it was too late. When he showed up, we treated him like a brother and a sister. We gave him too many of our secrets without really knowing who he was. God did not put us through slavery. We put ourselves through slavery. Why are we still going through what we're going through right now? Is this God miseducating our kids? Or is it black people letting them get miseducated? Is this God locking up all these black men? Or is it us not creating the jobs that force them to commit crime and then they go to jail? We got to be careful. Don't blame God for the irresponsibilities of black men and women. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that's a good answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have to take responsibility. We are too quick to blame God. Black folks got a bad habit of that. Yeah. Bad habit of that. The kids are killing each other in the community. I'm going to ask God why he letting this happen. Yeah. God letting it happen because you letting it happen. Remember. Central to African spirituality, family. God does not work for you. God works through you. You are the agency through which divine power activates itself. God never gets involved in human affairs. He goes through you and empowers you to make the change. Stop waiting and start being is what the message of today is. Last question is um one thing I somebody uh, burning some good incense. I need a pack of those. My mama will love them incense. Damn, they smell good. Okay, so uh, my last question is uh, one thing I, I I admire you for a lot of things, but one thing I really do admire you is how well your how good your memory is. Like you got phenomenal memory. But well, when you speak 250 times a year, <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. You know, I don't know if it's the memory or just the repetition. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, 
in one of your, I don't even know if you remember this, it was one radio show you was on. I'm, I think it was Denver, if I'm not mistaken. It was a, a black radio uh, show. Uh -huh. And you stated pretty much what you said a few minutes ago with uh, one of the questions over there. You said that uh, pretty much black people, we, we react to what white networks do. Yes. It's like not what white yes. people are doing, it's what we not doing. Yes. And one, We react uh, to racism. Yeah. We don't do nothing. Yeah. White man kill one of us, we do something. Or we are like, we are complain about a white network and not have an alternative. And absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And so one of your um one of your interviews you said pain. And the pain was an acronym. The Pan The Pan African Intelligence Network. Yeah. We need that. And so and the reason we need that yeah. is we do not have a communication system. How did you know Breonna Taylor got murdered? The white news told you. How did you know Haiti had an earthquake? White news told you. You see? Yeah, Every, yeah. Everything we learn, we got to wait on white folks to tell it. If the white man didn't tell you about Hurricane Katrina back in 2005, you wouldn't have knew thousands of black folks was underwater. Yeah. We need our own communications network. It was the Negro world in Garvey's day. But it needs to be something more sophisticated today. Man, that's, that's what gave me to my... Uh pretty much my question I um I've been studying for a few months of how to uh, to make and build a social media app pretty much because as I scroll down my Facebook timeline I always see the bashing of us you know what I'm saying us bashing each other and pretty much just self destruction of our people you know what I'm saying and constant bashing and things like that so I wanted to have an alternative so like I say for a few months, I've been studying on how to build a social media app, and I finally, like, you know, learned the blueprint and how to start one. And my question was, I wanted to use your acronym for my social media app. Sure you can. Yeah, all right. You got my blessing. You ain't got no white girlfriend, do you? No, sir. Okay, go ahead and use it. No, sir. <laughs> no, sir. <laughs> you better cut it out! <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry. I appreciate you. No problem. No problem. No problem. Who my number seven? Right there, the elder. And I think seven was the last one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. We want to cut it with seven because I want to start signing books and take pics before it get too late. Before you ask your question, brother, for the number seven, over here, because when we done, nobody's leaving here until you support at least two of the vendors that you see. So over here, I see we got family vending t-shirts, all kinds of t-shirts. What else is over there besides t-shirts? Organic. Repeat what he said, family. Organic coffee, shampoo, and we got t-shirts. And we also got some support black businesses signs. If you got a black business, you need that sign. You need that sign. What are we selling over there, family? African incense, t-shirts, sea moss, shea butter, bath salt, African soap, everything. Got you. And who we got over there? I see a lot of jewelry. What we got on that table, family? Candles. Footwear, T-shirts, jewelry, and who we got back here, Queen Mother? What you got? Jewelry for women and men or just women? Men and women. So before y'all leave, I need y'all to find two vendors. I don't care which two, but you're going to support. Thank you, Baba. Oh, sorry about that. You're going to support black businesses because I'm sick and tired of y'all making Chinese rich. Arabs rich, Anglo-Saxons rich, Jews rich. It's time to make each other rich. And don't forget, if you don't have a copy of my book, you can get it inside credit card, cash, or cash app. Inside, Sister Kira has the book. 550 pages of sample letters and other information you need to save your child this school year. Go ahead, Baba. Let's, let's talk to you you for giving me this privilege to speak. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a little, you know, and I'd like to say that uh, when, you was in my, when you were in Miami, 
uh, several weeks ago, I was there in Miami. Oh, you were there? Yeah. Oh, man. And uh, I texted you last night, and you responded, I think, within an hour. Okay. You gave me the location here. Yes, sir. And I also made reservations for her. The block party up in um, Oh yes, 9-11, brother. I want to see you. We're going to have fun. And when y'all come to the block party, make sure you take a picture with me in front of the Frederick Douglass High School on the red, black, and green sacred stone. We have a sacred stone. Make sure you take a picture with me on the sacred stone. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, Doc. Uh, FDMGfestival.com to register. Sorry. Yeah, I understand. You don't, don't really. No one knows me, but I mix military. I worked in three uh, U.S. I wonder why he's breaking up. Go ahead. It's too far from the mic. Too far. You might got to come over a little bit, Bobby. Come on up closer to the baby carriage then, which we invented as well. Can you hear me? So I, I'm a former federal employee, so everything that you say and has been saying, you are telling the truth. Thank you, Bobby. For years, I have been dealing, fighting white folks. I mean, I'm fighting white folks right now. And like you said, every white person is racist. That's true. That, that is a known fact. They are our sworn enemies. Absolutely. Absolutely. The reason why I say that is because I started my own business. I own, I own a trucking company. And I have uh, the documents right here with me, as well as my military records to prove to us who I am. I started a trucking company, I haul cars. And another 18 wheeler put my business out of business. Right. So my, I signed a contract with this trucking company that was worth $350,000. The attorneys that I hired, they were white. They submitted a $900,000 demand package. They never paid me the money and I've been fighting them for years. I've been talking to lawyers white lawyers who wouldn't help me. Black lawyers wouldn't help me. They did, this one law firm offered me $180,000. I told them I couldn't accept that, you know. So my question to you, since you're well known worldwide, is there any attorney that you know that might be able to help me in my case? I want you to look up Malik Zulu Shabazz who is chairman of the New Black Panther Party. He has Black Lawyers for Justice. Black Lawyers for Justice, Malik Zulu Shabazz, based in DC. He will be with me Tuesday in Harlem for the Marcus Garvey birthday celebration along with Dr. Leonard Jeffries. M-A-L-I-K Zulu Shabazz, S-H-A-B-A-Z-Z. -Z. And do a Google for his name. Also do a Google for Black Lawyers for Justice. And on Tuesday, if you text me, I can be sure to pass your information to him while we are together in Harlem, New York. But I think he would be the first place to start. Indeed, indeed. I want to give you one more attorney. You ready? One more attorney. Kamau. K-A-M-A-U, Kamau Franklin. He is the attorney for the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. He was good friends with the former mayor of Jackson, Mississippi, who I believe was murdered, Chukwe Lumumba, whose son is now the mayor of Jackson, Brother Antar Lumumba, but that's Kamau Franklin, K-A-M-A-U, Kamau Franklin, Malcolm X Grassroots Movement. Do a search for him as well. Those are the two lawyers I would recommend for your situation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Of course. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Oh, for sure. For sure. In fact, I read an article, and I want y'all to hear this. A couple years ago, I read an article. I think it was the Philadelphia Daily News. The article said that the FBI, 
FBI had intensified its community surveillance network. Y'all know what that means, right? That means they got more agents in the black community now, especially with this black identity extremist thing that they did create it, where they're going around targeting people who are black identity. I never heard of a Jewish identity extremist. I never heard of a Chinese. I thought you're supposed to be extreme in your identity with your people. Is there such thing as an American identity extremist? So how is there a black identity? And y'all saw the movie, Judas and the Black Messiah, right? Well, guess what? I did some research after that. And I learned that an FBI informant, this is not the agent. This is just the informant, the person in the hood who tells the agent what's going on. The informant can make a half million dollars a year. Did y'all hear what I just said? So you know, see, when I thought informants, you know what I thought? I thought a couple hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars. No, brother. They are making more money than NFL and NBA athletes. Now, I know we got some coons in here like, damn, I should go sign up. <laughs> okay. I'm not telling y'all to become a traitor to your community. I'm telling y'all you got to watch everybody because most of us look at the corner boys to be the informants. It's the highest placed amongst us. Yep. Remember, Al Sharpton admitted to wearing a wire against the mob. If you are willing to risk your life wearing a wire against the mob, imagine what you'll do against black folks. You feel me? Remember, Jesse Jackson, these are not my words, according to William, uh, William Pepper, Dr. King family attorney. If you haven't read the book, Orders to Kill and the Assassination of Dr. King, you better read it. He names Jesse Jackson unquestionably as an accomplice to the murder. They say Jesse called off the security at the Divine Lorraine Hotel in Memphis on April 4th. There was a group of black brothers. Like when I go around, I got brothers here doing security for me. Get them a hand, by the way, for helping to keep Dr. Umar safe. So when Dr. King got to Memphis, there was a bunch of brothers who said, we're going to hold you down on the strength. Jesse Jackson told them they wasn't needed. He called them off. Jesse called them off. And within about an hour, Dr. King was dead. Also, somebody from the Southern Christian Leadership Office called the hotel. Dr. King was on the ground floor. He wasn't supposed to be up in room 306. Somebody from the SCLC office called the hotel and said Dr. King requests that his room be upstairs. They needed him upstairs so the Memphis police officer who killed Dr. King, Dr. King was murdered by a Memphis police officer. The Memphis police officer who murdered Dr. King could get a clean shot. And then the Green Berets, who was the backup shooter, said that they were told that friendlies were not wearing ties. Anybody who was not wearing the tie should not be shot. Why did Jesse Jackson not have a tie on that day? How did he know not to get shot? You see? So you got to be careful out here. Like people ask me, why you don't travel with security? Every leader we got was done in by the traveling security. You feel me? Everybody was done in by the traveling security. Now one day I might have to do that. Don't get me wrong. But I'm keeping that off as long as I can. You feel me? Malcolm was done it by security. King was done it by Patrice Lumumba was done it by security. I'm a Cal Cabral, his security. Fred Hampton, the damn Judas, poisoned his Kool-Aid. Poisoned the Kool-Aid and gave the FBI the whole layout of the Fred Hampton house, which his son is still trying to save in Chicago, by the way. But here's the only issue I had with Judas and the Black Messiah. The movie shouldn't have ended there. The movie should have kept going to show you the investigation into Hampton's death because it would have exposed how the FBI was more involved than the movie really. I mean, they showed you that it was them, but they didn't show you the cover up. They didn't show you the case. They didn't show you all the facts that came out after Hampton's murder. Remember, they said all 99 bullets came from the Panthers gun. All 99 bullets came from the cops. The Panthers only shot one bullet, brother Mark Clark, rest in peace, which was a reaction bullet to getting shot. 
They didn't show you that. And why did Fred Hampton have to die on December? What date was that? Second. You know why he had to die? He just came back from a meeting with Huey and Bobby. They was elevating Fred Hampton at the age of 21 to the Central Committee of the National Black Panther Party, and he was going to be their chief spokesperson. FBI said, you can't, you can't let him go national. Fred Hampton was the closest thing we had to a Malcolm. You see what I'm saying? He was only 21. Malcolm and Martin was in their 30s when they hit. Fred hit at 21. Well, King was in his 22 with the Montgomery bus boycott. But on that national piece, Fred would have been the youngest. Fred Hampton was so powerful that the white man said he can't live. We cannot let him assume that office. You always have to look at the timing of assassinations to figure out who killed him. Why was Johnny Cochran poisoned? They killed Johnny Cochran because after he got OJ off and Geronimo Pratt off, Johnny Cochran was investigating how much money the U.S. government owes black people for reparations. He was too legitimate. He had to die because they couldn't let him put the numbers out. Malcolm had to die on uh, February 21st because Malcolm was scheduled to go to a third world revolutionary leaders conference with Che Guevara, Fidel Castro, and the African independence leaders. They said, if you let Malcolm go to that, it's going to be on. So you always look at the timing of the deaths to let you know why they died and who was behind it. No, Dr. King was suffocated to death in the hospital. Dr. King showed up alive at the hospital, and this is in the book by William Pepper. And how do we know that he was suffocated to death at the hospital? A white nurse. A white nurse in the room said that they pushed us to the side, told us to get out, but she did not leave. She stayed at the door, and she watched the doctor and the FBI agent put a pillow over Dr. King's face and suffocated him to death. And just like they said when they killed Fred Hampton, that nigga good and dead now. And y'all want to keep trusting white folks. You just go ahead. Go ahead. Y'all don't get it. We have no idea. What did Napoleon Bonaparte say when his general came back to France and said, we have to crush the Haitian Revolution? No, he said, why do you want to crush this revolution so much? Why not just let them have that island? What did Napoleon Bonaparte say? Napoleon said, we cannot let Toussaint L'Overture and Jean-Jacques Dessalines take this island. Not because it's a French possession. He said, the reason we must crush the Haitian Revolution is because we must prevent forever, forever, the march of black people in the world. Wow. Look how much they hate you. And if it wasn't for the Haitian Revolution, America wouldn't even be the size she is because the Haitian Revolution bankrupted France and they sold their U.S. territories to the United States government, which made the size of this country four times what it was. So ain't that something? Yeah. America has to thank the Haitian Revolution for its current size. She wouldn't have Louisiana. She wouldn't have Florida. I'm not sure if she had Texas, but all them little states right there, that was all France. Yeah. Our ancestors gave that to America when they won that war. Yeah. Can't nobody let us rise, brother. Listen, this is what I need y'all to get. If we stand, everybody else fall because they stand on our back. If 80% of the world lives off the resources of Africa, if you free up those resources and put them under black control where they belong, everybody else is down. That's why they get rid of you. Absolutely. That's one of the reasons why they assassinated Gaddafi. I'm not no Gaddafi fan. I think it was an Arab opportunist, but I appreciated what he was doing. The reason they had to kill Gaddafi because they was working to do an African dollar, an African currency, back with the resources of Africa. You can't do that. Africa, the richest... Content in the world. If you back Africa's money to our resources, whose money can be worth more? That was economic revolution. Yeah. And that's why they had to kill him. And you ain't seen the African leader step up yet and say we need to go back to that continental no. dollar. No. They scared. They, they scared. We got to really understand the Chinese can't afford you to stand. The Arab can't afford you to stand. The Jew can't afford for you to stand. The white men, we don't have no friends but each other. But that's all we need is each other. Yeah, right. We just got to get our minds right. Stop hating on each other. Stop undercutting each other. Stop and like running. I always say, until black people hate racism more than each other, we'll never be free. On that note, I'm going to come right down here because this is where the light is. 
and I'm going to start signing books and taking pictures. If you have a book for me to sign, please take it out the plastic. If you want to take a picture, please have your phone ready. You might need a little bit. You might need to put your flash on, maybe, but this might be enough light for you. So I'm going to come on down. Black power. Thank you. Thank you.